In 2001, silly rom-com turned, and I'll say it, feminist classic, Legally Blonde appeared on our screens and enchanted us all. Or at least, I hope it enchanted all of you too. I loved it. It managed to show us that women can be smart, creative, ambitious, and successful regardless of whether you love frilly pink dresses or sharp suits or anything in between, to be honest. It challenged the notion that women must always be competing with each other for jobs, for men, for anything, and instead proposed that we are way stronger when we work together. And it also showed us that sometimes getting the guy you think you want isn't always what you need, and that often there are way more important things in life. I personally love the film. I think it's great fun. And it even went on to inspire an equally fun and enjoyable musical and a couple of sequels which maybe weren't so great, I'll be honest. Um, but did you know it was actually based on a book also titled Legally Blonde by Amanda Brown? I didn't actually know this myself until I saw this video by the Drama Dorks and immediately paused the video to go and read and experience this book for myself and that's why I'm here making this video. But I also encourage you to go check out the video and channel that inspired this as well because since writing my script I've watched it and it's a fantastic video. I think we maybe make a few of the same points, but it's what happens, isn't it? Um, yeah, I still credit them with giving me the idea and just wanted to point that out. So Legally Blonde, the novel, was written by Amanda Brown, a Stanford Law student just bursting with internalised misogyny and contempt for everyone around her. It's fascinating. The book, the history of it, Oh, I have a lot to say. Whoever bought this book and turned it into a film script literally only took the blonde woman at law school premise and seemingly scrapped almost everything else and actually turned this mess of a novel into a good story. And that's why I kind of wanted to make this video and compare and contrast the two today. We're going to be going through the book and the film side by side and looking how you can take a, the same premise and a character with pretty much only the same name <laughs> and create such different pieces of art and media, both in terms of message, execution, and how enjoyable they are to consume. Amanda initially wrote the novel to air out her personal frustrations with law school and the other students there, although she now claims it's an attempt at satire. Yeah. Mm, maybe not. It's basically just mocking pretty much every woman and man, but mostly the women around her. And to me, all this says is that she just hates women. She has a lot of internalized misogyny. She's not a girl's girl. She has no respect for other women in a way that's really heartbreaking to see. And ultimately, she's just very mean. According to articles and interviews, Amanda dropped out of Stanford Law School after two years to write a novel based loosely on her experiences. Legally Blonde was this novel. One article goes on to say that the characters of Serena and Margot, Elle's lovable, bumbling sorority sisters, are based on two of Amanda's best girlfriends. And as I'm sure you'll see as we review this book in depth, um, I don't know about anyone else, but I would be offended if a supposed friend of mine wrote about me in the way that Amanda writes about these girls and everyone else she knows in this book. The characters of Serena and Margot are shallow, vapid, and often just plain mean. Amanda's self-insert character of Elle Woods is the worst, though. She's rude, entitled, again, just mean to people. She's awful. She's nothing like the smart, creative, hard-working, kind, caring Elle that we know from the film. When the book Legally Blonde was first written and pitched to publishers, um, it wasn't actually published as a book, but the movie rights to it were sold and turned into the Legally Blonde film. The book itself only actually ended up being published in, I want to say, something like 2004? Um, but that's annoyingly not in my notes because I'm an idiot, so I'll try and fact check and put it on screen right now. I did find this one article written in 2004, which is a sort of review or report about a party that Amanda held to promote her book two years after the film came out, sorry, 2003 then, ignore me, um, in which the journalist said, clearly we're meant to think that Amanda and Elle are one, of the, are one and the same, and that's ironic because Amanda Brown is no Elle Woods. Elle is ditzy and obsessed with nail care for sure, but unlike Amanda, she's no quitter. And she's super nice, to use the legally blonde vernacular, which is more than some of the folks in the crowd tonight say of Amanda. This article is honestly, like, it's scathing. Like in one section where Amanda reminisces with the journalist about her high school experience in Arcadia, the journalist writes, Her sunny perspective on Arcadia contrasts with the backstabbing, bitchy place. The petri dish for the mean girl syndrome now widely examined by sociologists na nationwide that others remember. Amanda found it one of the friendliest places she'd ever been and even says the atmosphere there spawned Elle Woods a sunny disposition. Legally Blonde the book 
is very much based on Amanda's life and she's not afraid to hide that. And you'll see with characters like Elle and everyone else, this isn't a case of a good author writing a mean or bad or villainous character. Like, I just filmed my review for Yellowface by Rebecca Kwong and I'm saying, like, that has a villainous narrator who is meant to be villainous and it works really, really well and it's great. This isn't that. This is just an example of a mean girl who is writing a self-insert character and expecting everyone to love her, despite that character and herself being incredibly mean and rude and condescending and just horrible in every way. Book L. Woods is thoroughly, thoroughly unlikable. The other stories of Amanda in this article include stories about how her mum had, had to literally beg one of her university lecturers to allow Amanda to pass a required maths course because she just kept failing it over and over and over, so she had to come and get mummy to buy her way into passing. Another story tells about how Amanda kept getting rejected from various not so prestigious law schools, but was finally accepted into the super competitive Stanford Law School, which is just a bit odd, isn't it? And I'm not saying it had anything to do with her dad working with and being besties with one of the admissions officers and her parents having no sway at the other law schools, but it's an interesting coincidence. Once at Stanford, um, Amanda wasn't happy either. Her mum uh, recalls complaints like of both hers and Amanda's of things like, when I went there and saw it, I was in shock. You should have seen the people there. Never have I seen an uglier room. It was yucky. The students were equally gross, Amanda says, recalling that many didn't shower. She didn't like the students who had come from Ivy League college colleges and had even less... less and had even less respect for the Trekkies. This was back in the early 90s when Star Trek was still hot amongst the pocket protected crowd. With her designer wardrobe and pink legal pads, Amanda did not fit in, nor did she care to, she insists. But that doesn't mean her feelings didn't get hurt when there were no invitations to slumber parties and keggers. And while I understand it, it, it is difficult when you don't fit in somewhere. I know that firsthand, I've experienced it a hell of a lot. And I know that it's hard when you feel threatened by other people because you don't feel as smart as them or as deserving to be there. I get that sometimes you'll lash out in insecurity, completely relatable. But Amanda took that to a whole new level when she began to ignore her studies in favour of lighting, in favour of writing letters back home to her friends there, mocking the other students, mainly the women on her course, for things like being interested in the course they were studying, taking their work seriously, being feminists, and the clothes they decided to wear. It was typical mean girl behaviour. It was these letters that ended up the basis for her novel Legally Blonde, and that's why the book is so damn mean. It's awful. And when we compare Amanda's real life, the book, and the film, it is striking, like, just how different the contrast is. No, the words, words aren't wording. You know what I'm trying to say. The contrast is striking. There we go. Real life Amanda felt alienated because she wasn't smart enough for the course her parents had brought her way onto, so she mocked the other girls and guys on that course, both privately and publicly, and ignored her work, inst instead choosing to read fashion magazines in class, and threw away an incredible opportunity that others would have killed for. Book L does much the same thing, although she does work a little harder at times than Amanda does, but not, not obviously not a lot. Um, whereas Film L, on the other hand, she doesn't need to buy her way in, she works genuinely hard to earn her place at law school, uh, She f and when she felt excluded by the other students, she fought back with kindness and determination, and showed people that their preconceptions of her were wrong, and she continued to work hard throughout the entire film. So with all this in mind, let's go through both the book and film chronologically, and compare and contrast as we go, and it should be a little bit of fun. So I think we all remember how the film opens. We are introduced to Elle Woods, a seemingly shallow, dumb blonde who actually turns out to be incredibly creative, ambitious, intelligent, and most importantly, kind. She is getting ready to start her day by brushing her long blonde hair, putting on her strappy high heels, and applying a pink sparkly lip gloss. The book, however, opens with Elle and her two best friends, Margot and Serena, sat around having the most sexist, body-shaming discussion of women's bodies um, in which women simply cannot win. If you have natural breasts, then they're not good enough. If you have implants, then you're also not good enough. Basically, there's no right way to be a woman. We're all disgusting and this book tells us right from the off. Chapter one. 
Elle Woods glanced at the reflection of her bickering sorority sisters Margot and Serena in her vanity mirror. She sat on a pink-skirted stool with faux fur trim that matched the comforter on her bed, where her chihuahua, underdog, was comfortably resting. At least mine won't sag, Serena pointed at her saline-enhanced chest. My boobs are as perky as the day I put them on my credit card. So what if they'll never sag, Margot said unimpressed. They're hard as rocks. They're also blocking the only natural light in the room, Elle whispered to Underdog, who looked up sympathetically. Both Underdog and Elle had heard Serena and Margot's argument countless times before. Elle refused to get involved because her father, the trendy Beverly Hills plastic surgeon Dr. Wyatt Woods, known among the mic- known among the nip-tuck crowd as the best for breasts, had done Serena's work. Anyhow, Elle had a more pressing concern. They're not hard, they're firm, Serena said, and stamped her foot. There wasn't half an inch between Serena and Margot, squared off chest to chest. Margot's lips, pouty from last year's lip injections, were set in a glossy purple smile that matched the Nike swoop on her little used cross trainers. Despite the fact that Margot had undergone enough plastic surgery to be on a frequent slicer plan, she told Elle that she prided herself on the fact she had never let a doctor touch her boobs. Clinically, anyway. Have you guys forgotten? Tonight could be the night! Elle shouted to get Serena and Margot's attention. I need to look perfect. I want everything to be exactly right tonight. Like, can we just not with this body shaming nonsense? Sadly though, this was an absolutely normal product of its time. This is how women's bodies were spoken about back in the early 2000s and it was a nightmare, you know? But I'm so happy that the film version of Legally Blonde cut out nonsense like this and decided not to go down any of that body shaming route at least not overtly, because while the film wasn't perfect, and I do still have some issues with it that I'll discuss further in this video, um, overall it was a breath of fresh air compared to some other media at the time, compared to this book, and um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think most of us who grew up in the, in the 90s and early 2000s uh, will remember just how bad it was back then for body shaming women and our appearance just been judged in every way like there literally wasn't a way for a woman to look or exist without criticism and seeing that sort of stuff as a kid messes with your head so much like as a 31 year old woman it still messes with my head stuff that I heard and read when I was a kid so I feel like reading passages like this in the book um bring back a lot of personal anger for me, you know? Um, anger towards the author for perpetuating these ridiculous, harmful ideologies, and also pity for her too for being a victim of the time as well, you know? The rest of the chapter isn't so different from the film, you know? Elle is preparing to go to dinner with Warner, who she thinks is going to propose to her. However, instead of being encouraged by a whole sorority of friends, she just has the two, Margot and Serena, who can't stop bickering with and judging each other's appearance the whole time. There's less of a focus on girls supporting girls and more of, ooh, all us girls are in competition all the time because we need to do what men want. The book doesn't have the dress shop scene either, which is a real shame because in the film and the musical, actually, it's a brilliant introduction to Elle. It shows that her and her friends love and support each other so much. It shows that Elle is not ashamed of her love of fashion and girly things. And most importantly, it shows that Elle is not stupid and Elle is not afraid to stand up for herself. The shop assistant immediately underestimates her and tries to scam her because she wrongfully believes she's just a dumb blonde, but Elle proves her wrong and isn't afraid to stand up and say no and share her knowledge to right an injustice, which ultimately is what the whole film is about. We don't get any of this in the book. Instead, all we get is Elle stood frozen, suddenly unsure of her choice. Would it be the dress she would want to tell her great-grandchildren about when she regaled them with stories about the night Warner proposed? What if it looked dated and stupid by then? No, that's it, Elle, Margot said. I'm positive. Red is the colour of confidence and it matches your aura. Well, I don't want to look like I expect anything. Elle tucked her smooth golden blonde hair behind her ears, checking that the diamond earrings Warner had given her for her birthday were securely in place. He'll ask. You know it's coming, L. Serena said, sounding mi mildly annoyed. Anyway, Margot's right. Red is better. Which is in no way as impactful or interesting, and honestly it tells us so little about L and what she values and who she is, other than I guess she cares a lot about a proposal. But what does it tell us, really? The first chapter also features lines like, Group hug! Margot announced, and suddenly Elle was sandwiched between the biggest and most expensive boobs in the Delta Gamma house. Which is hilarious, but not for the reasons that the author thinks. <laughs> the other main difference is that in the book, 
instead of the whole sorority being super happy and excited for Elle and being there to support her, Elle and her two friends try to use this possible upcoming proposal to make every other girl in the sorority jealous by making a big show of the flowers that Warner brings and flashing wedding magazines around obnoxiously. And it's just, it's not nice, you know? Again, vast contrast to the film where all her friends are lined up to see Elle off on her big date. They offer her little touch-ups to her makeup and her perfume before she goes, pass her a handbag. You know, and it really saw and it really solidifies this message of women supporting women and how important that is right from the start of the film. In the book, the scene in the restaurant is interesting, considering Elle is a self-insert of the author. Elle's entrance into the Ivy caused a stir. Even here, where every night the restaurant was filled with long-legged blondes and movie stars, her radiant beauty and sweet smile made her stand out. Several men tried to get her attention as she and Warner made their way to the table. Warner wore a look of satisfaction as he observed the other men admiring Elle. All I say is I just wish I had a tenth of the self-confidence of Amanda Brown. <laughs> Another big and really substantial change is that while film Warner is such a pig, we don't like him, Book Warner is so much worse. He is the biggest pig out there. We get moments like this. Actually, we're ready to order, Warner said abruptly without looking at the menu or the waiter. Elle and the waiter exchanged puzzled glances as she began to protest, but was silenced when Warner ordered a bottle of, a bottle of crystal. He must be nervous, she thought, and immediately felt sorry for him as he got ready to ask the biggest question of his life. She lowered her head and looked up through her Chanel enhanced lashes. I don't hate this so much because he is supposed to be the villain, right? But I'm like, mate, if a man is acting like this and like interrupting you and ordering for you and then just, just dump him. And then we get the purposefully cringe inducing moment when Warner doesn't propose to Elle and it's meant to be cringy, so that's fine. Um, but he's so much harsher with it in the book than the film. Yeah. Can we also take a moment to just grumble at typos? Like, did I forgot to tell you? <laughs> Come on. I had to ask myself, Warner, is it worth it to go through any more of my life with a girl who will never be serious enough to be my wife or the mother of my children? Do you know the courage this took, Elle? How hard it was for me? He paused for a moment and appraised her cleavage. Really hard, he added. He looked down, apparently wounded by his own high standards. <laughs> I didn't think I could hate any Warner more than film Warner, but I do. Book Warner is the worst, and he only gets worse and worse as the book goes on. The references in this book are also really something. Some have aged wonderfully, others have not. Uh, some are a mix of both, like this. So as Warner drives Elle home, Elle could not believe what had happened. She stared at Warner's perfect profile. This is not happening, she said to herself. It's 2002. It's a time of Buffy, Charmed and Charlie's Angels. Be strong. Elle imagined Warner meeting up with Buffy in a dark alley and felt a tiny bit better until the violence of the image was shattered by a glimpse of her still unadorned left hand. She felt trapped in an Aaron Spelling drama where bad things happen to good looking people. The, I, I'm a huge Buffy fan, so I kind of liked it. Um, I feel like the Buffy references work fine, even the charmed one, because uh, they're, they're classics, but others didn't work so well like this. Trying hard to hide her devastation, Elle Woods entered the spacious TV room of the University of Southern California Delta Gamma House. Not expecting Elle to come home for at least a few more hours, Margot and Serena were completely engrossed in the Osbournes. I heard Kelly Osbourne has an MTV VJ who is seriously into her, Serena said. Hmm, that's cool, Margot responded, pursing her lips the way she did when she was thinking really hard. Elle then immediately gets mad at her friends for watching TV and not immediately noticing that she'd walked silently into the house because she really does think she's the centre of everyone's world and it's frustrating. Serena and Margot stared at Elle and then at each other in genuine disbelief. If Elle and Warner weren't getting married, what would become of the rest of them? Everyone knew Elle and Warner were perfect together. They went together like shampoo and conditioner. I won't comment, but it's hilarious. The film has pop culture references too, but they do feel a little more relevant long term than the ones in the book. Like the iconic line when Warner breaks up with Elle and says that he needs to marry a Jackie, not a Marilyn, um, which honestly we could do a whole video essay in itself dissecting, but no time. There's other moments from the film that I really love that we just don't get in this book, like the moment where uh, Warner's like, I need someone serious, and Elle goes, I am seriously in love with you, isn't that enough? that's that's heartbreaking and that again does a really good job of building Elle's character and showing us who she is and that 
despite what other people might think at first glance, she's not actually shallow. Warner is. Warner is the one who cares about appearances and what other people think. Elle just cares about love and having a real relationship. And that's what the film shows us. We don't get any of that in the book. Elle is just that shallow in the book. This part of the book is really short and doesn't really tell us much about what Elle is feeling other that she's angry and embarrassed about what people will think and how she won't get the expensive ring she wanted now, so boo-hoo. There are way better guys around here than Warner, Elle, Serena said. You know how Javier is dying to date you. Serena's ex-boyfriend Javier was moneyed through his family's investment firm, which had wisely bought California's largest cement manufacturer and celebrated enthusiastically after every earthquake. Thinking about Serena's sloppy seconds made Elle want to cry harder. Her perfectly tanned shoulders shook with every sob. I was just positive Warner was going to propose to me tonight. I feel so humiliated. She looked sadly at her left hand. I thought the Huntington Rock of Gibraltar was mine for sure. You remember the rock? The family six carat? Margot and Serena nodded solemnly. Why would he tell me about that ring if he wasn't going to marry me? And the chapter ends with Elle realising that the problem must stem from Warner's grandmother not approving of her because when she met her I should have seen it coming when Grand Mummy Huntington hate that came back uh, came to LA for Warner's birthday last month Elle conceded Warner hasn't been the same since Grand Mummy oh, I hate that I hate it so much I, I don't even like to say it Grand Mummy ignored me through the entire dinner and then as she was leaving told me I reminded her of Pamela Anderson Ooh, Pamela Anderson Serena and Margot said in unison that was the ultimate insult and again, I know it's a product of the time, but I can't get behind this horrible shaming of women, just in general. Like, Pamela Anderson, especially in the, like, 2000s and stuff, was treated so badly by the media and just generally by the public. It was appalling, and it's it's really disturbing to see her used as the butt of the joke so casually in books like this, you know? Pamela Anderson is far more intelligent and thoughtful than people give her credit for, and if anything, she's m far more like Film L. Woods is than Book Elwoods is, or Amanda Brown is. Do you know what I mean? Pamela Anderson could run rings around Amanda Brown in terms of kindness and intelligence. Come on. Now, this isn't to say that the film is perfect either. There are still some body shaming moments in it which aren't great. Um, like, there's this one moment where a random woman in the salon says that the woman that Warner's brother is engaged to is practically deformed, but I appreciate that they never make our protagonist Elle a mean girl. She's never the one who does any body shaming. It's at this point in the film that Elle decides to become more serious by going to law school. At this point, she's been through weeks of mourning her relationship, and now she's finally in her comfort place, the salon, she's doing her research, she's thinking for herself, and she comes to the conclusion that law school is the right move for her. In contrast, in the book, it doesn't feel quite as... earned. Elle's tears gave way to resolve as she and her two best friends worked late into the evening devising plans to bring Warner to his senses. Elle decided around 3am that she would go to law school and beat Warner at his own game. Decided maybe after one too many pink margaritas. Tequila induced or not, the idea stuck. If Warner was going to Stanford Law School to find someone serious, he was going to find one serious L. Woods. So yeah, it doesn't feel quite as earned. But one of the things that I do appreciate about the book is that it showed how L skills translated strangely well to the law school exams. And I do have to commend this. It, it's funny, but it's relevant, and I do like it about the book. It's one of the few things I do did like. Elle spent the rest of the fall semester in hibernation, studying for the law school aptitude test, which she'd scheduled to take in January. Everyone attributed her social disappearance to her breakup with Warner. Three months later, Elle was positively beaming as she emerged from the LSAT. Not only were there required sections of Breeze, but the extra section, Logic Games, allowed her to use what she considered to be one of her greatest strengths, abstract organisation. Ever since high school, Elle had been a whiz at seating arrangements for parties, saving events that could have been a diversity disaster without her strategic social skills. She was famous for the dinner parties to which she would invite sorority sisters with open rivalries or roommates on the outs. She partnered talkers with listeners and athletes with beauties with dazzling success. So when she encountered the silly time zone puzzles in the logic games section, she finished four minutes ahead of the clock. Nothing on the exam could come close to approaching the subtleties and entanglements of Elle's social world. So I did really like this about the book, but I think I still preferred the portrayal in the film, which shows Elle's hard work and growth and how she only really managed it because she had the support of so many of her friends there for her. You know, they were egging her on and helping her and encouraging her and 
you know, giving her all the emotional support she needed, you know? In the book, her actual studying process is glossed over and it's made clear that Elle had to do it all alone. Um, in the book, she even gets her admissions letter alone, as opposed to in the film where all her friends are there waiting to see her open it and they're waiting for the results. And, you know, they, they lift her up and celebrate with her and it's just a really nice heartwarming moment. Then the film portrays Elle's arrival at Harvard Law School because it's Harvard in the film, Stanford in the book. The film portrays Elle's arrival at law school as this big, wonderful moment. We see her joy, her excitement, the music is like poppy and fun and great and like really inspiring. And even though plenty of people around her are judging her, she doesn't let it phase her. In fact, she barely notices because she's too busy caring for her dog, Bruiser, as opposed to underdog in the book. Um, and underdog is just kind of there in the book. He's like an accessory, he's just kind of in the background, whatever. In the film, I love Bruiser. Bruiser's a little gem, he's got his own little personality. Elle clearly absolutely loves him to bits and has a deep connection with him. Underdog is more of an inconvenient accessory to Elle in the book. Bruiser is doing his own thing, he's picking up cards and bringing them to Elle, he's, you know, he's actually like supporting her when she needs it, it's lovely. In contrast, in the book, Elle's arrival at Stanford Law School is more lacklustre and full of complaints. It's not a happy moment. Which is madness. <laughs> Elle couldn't believe how demoralising the Crothers dormitory was. Her dorm room was less than half the size of her walk-in closet at home and had a low ceiling, dingy grey walls and a tile floor of an undeterminable colour. A solitary window provided the only light. And immediately, Elle does not take any of her studies seriously. Elle looked at her watch and realised she was already late. She left her dorm room and moving men who were grappling with how to wedge in at least three times the amount of clothing and personal items as the room was meant to hold, and drove hurriedly to orientation. She parked a Range Rover and considered what to do with Underdog. And immediately Elle and the narrator, or both, or whatever, are judging the appearance of the other students at Stanford for literally no reason. Some of the descriptions include things like um, a table full of Euro wannabes, power book flourishing techies and trekkies, and a now convention of before candidates for beauty makeovers. It's just horrible name calling, and if the articles are to be believed, then these are taken straight from the then these are taken straight from the pages of Amanda, the author's letters to her friends about her own time at law school. So remember that this isn't just a mean girl in a book calling people names. This is a real person in real life describing real people in this way that's just now been translated into fiction. Amanda really said these things about real people and it's horrible. This is one of the places where the book and film really diverge the most. most. Elle's arrivals at law school both show people judging others for how they look, but the film is focused on others misjudging Elle, not taking her seriously and her proving them wrong and everyone learns a good lesson. But in the book, it's about Elle judging everyone for not being her idea of pretty and then continuing to judge them and trying to change them and still judging them by the end of the book. It's horrible. And so much of it is just really unnecessary, like this scene where Elle goes to the bookshop to get her books, and she's standing in line behind another law student and his proud parents when Elle thinks about the mother. Mrs Baxter smiled at Edward and pushed him along, her eyes twinkling amid crow's feet and wrinkles that came from too much time on the tennis court without a visor. Elle realised with horror that Anne Baxter's dress was a Lily Pulitzer, almost exactly like the one Elle had purchased at Barney's after seeing it in the What's Hot column in Allure. Squinting at the flamingo pink print, Elle made a mental note to start a goodwill pile immediately. It's during this time that the dad tells a story of a friend of his who skipped lots of law school classes but still went on to become a professor, and from this, Elle learns. Elle stepped out of line, deciding the moral of Kaplan's story was that if he had never bought his books and still managed to become a professor, then there was no need for her to worry about missing her regular manicure time, which would fall during criminal law. This book is awful and Elle is so unlikable. She has no redeeming characteristics. Next up in both the book and the film we get the iconic scene where Warner is shocked to see Elle at law school. In the film I love how they did this. Elle spots Warner but composes herself, takes a second and then walks straight past him pretending not to see him. It's such a power move. We love it. And then when he's all like, how did you get into love at her? She's like, what? Like it's hard? love that love that for her even though you know she totally did work hard to get there you're still cheering her on because it's her way of saying screw you don't underestimate me we love it we love that scene beautiful in the film Elle completely dominates the conversation and then leaves on her own terms because she has to get to class a class she genuinely cares about <sighs> let's compare that to the book at nine o'clock the following morning Elle was back at the law school for registration 
L, Warner exclaimed with what was clearly surprise. Redundant. Exclamation. Clearly surprise. You, you don't need them both. Anyway. It's poorly written as well as stupid. L noticed that his yellow shirt matched his sun-bleached hair. He pulled a pale, frowning brunette standing beside him closer. What are you doing here? He looked with curiosity at Elle's Laura Ashley pastel sundress and sensible string of pearls. She hadn't seen Warner approaching, and his simple question caught her off guard. I'm registering, like everybody else. Elle had thought of a million lines to say to Warner, but the sight of him with another woman evaporated her confidence and her repertoire of snappy Warner witticisms. Registering for what? This isn't the textiles department, Elle. Warner laughed. Warner is the worst, but I also feel like the author's decision to have Elle be so passive here is just frustrating, and that's another reason why I prefer the film. We're also immediately introduced to Warner's fiancée here. In the film, it is Vivian. In the book, it's Sarah. Sarah is Warner's old school friend, slash friend of the family, slash ex-girlfriend, now fiancé. And from her internal monologue, which we also see in the book, we learn she is just as mean and judgmental as Elle. They're just two sides of the same coin, really. So this introduction scene is literally just a scene of Warner talking over two women while they just judge the hell out of each other's appearances for no good reason. She glanced at the preppy woman who was pulling Warner's sleeve, anxious for his attention. This is Sarah, Warner said, turning towards his companion. Her mousy brown hair was bobbed and cemented in place by a navy blue headband with applique daisies. Elle stared at Sarah through the pink tinted lenses of her olive people's sunglasses and managed a weak smile. Oliver people, I don't know who that is. Um, Sarah reached out tentatively and shook Elle's hand limply as she surveyed Elle with contempt, deciding that Warner must have been blinded by Elle's lustrous blonde hair. She was certainly nothing like the decent friends he'd had at Groton. In theory, before she'd seen her, Sarah had accepted Elle as within tolerable bounds of Warner's youthful randiness, a college fling. Now gawking at what Sarah surmised to be a Barbie doll with a pulse in her flower print sunglasses, sundresses, she realised she had underestimated the depths to which Warner had sunk since he left Groton. Wrenching her hand from Elle's, Sarah adjusted her headband to display the massive diamond on her left hand. Sarah Nottingham, Warner's fiancé, she said pointedly, in her best Groton drawl. Elle is obviously sad, so instead of doing the things she needs to and going to class and blah blah blah, she just goes back to her dorm room where she plopped on the bed and patted it so Underdog would jump up. Underdog, you've got to keep quiet, Elle warned, clamping his tiny mouth to stifle a bark. You're not allowed, but I need a friend here. She pulled her do dog's soft ears affectionately. I'm sorry, but she clamped his tiny mouth shut. That's not how you stop a dog barking. You don't physically wrestle their mouth closed. That's... Horrible. Can we not mistreat dogs here? This is another reason we hate Book L. Woods. Animal abuse. The first meeting of Fiancé and Elle in the film is very different. So as I say, in the film, it's Vivian. So I know different character names might get confusing, but you guys are smart. You got this. Um, Elle first meets Vivian in the film in a law class. And again, I prefer this because the focus is on how their relationship develops throughout the film outside of Warner. Their rivalry and eventual friendship happens despite Warner, not because of it, you know? But at this point in both the book and film, Elle feels out of her depth. In the books, Elle has a cry and feels out of her depth because Warner is engaged and she wasn't expecting that. In the film, however, Elle has a bit of a cry and feels out of her depth because she missed a class reading assignment and when she felt like another woman, Vivian, would have her back like she's used to, she didn't and now she feels betrayed. This is such an excellent setup for how Elle and Vivian's um, relationship and character growth will go in the film because Vivian learns to stop being so guarded and seeing everyone as a rival and instead learns to trust and support other women. Elle Mill Elle, meanwhile, is taking another step towards learning that she needs to be more serious about her education and that hard work pays off in the long run. So it's a perfect first interaction for them both and where their characters grow to. Also, in the film, neither woman knows that the other has a connection to Warner at this point, so it really does set them up as independent women outside of their relationship to a man, which I love and feel is really, really important. In the film, Elle ends up being kicked out of class where she meets Emmett and he tells her that the reality of law school will be tough but he's encouraging and he gives her great advice that she really listens to and appreciates and we see this warm and friendly side of Elle who is super grateful for the advice until she's interrupted by Warner again. None of this happens in the book though. 
after meeting Warner and Sarah and crying about it, Elle decides to call up her old sorority friends, Serena and Margot, on her fuzzy pink princess style phone. Oh, 2001. <laughs> The conversation is literally just fluff um, and it's nothing other than the other women saying that they're going to a new weight loss program called Jesus is the Way. I had almost forgotten how insidious 2001 diet culture was. It's oh, so harmful. Then there's a scene where Elle is walking across campus and I, oh, I can't cope with this. Ignorance is one thing, but this is just too far. She noticed a few political tables had been set up and Elle approached one with interest. The table sign read, burn your bra, and though Elle was worried that the woman with the frizzy brown bandana tied hair clutching a clipboard was a movie extra for a 60s movie, she was still glad to see something that she thought she recognised. She smiled as she remembered the bra burning party she'd given for Serena after her augmentation. An LA post-surgery tradition, all of the guests brought lingerie for the guest of honour in her new cup size. As Elle neared the table, the table worker jumped up to yell at a couple of fraternity pledgers who dropped a few pages of Playboy magazine on her table and then ran away laughing. Elle noticed with distaste that the woman definitely hadn't replaced the bra that she had burned. Bra burning is a political statement, the gender warrior exploded. Elle squinted puzzled. Are you talking to me? She asked her. Liberate women from the dominance of male imposed body image, force fed by capitalists, boycott the wonder bra. Elle left quickly, deciding that her first overture to Stanford activities would be her last. Again, I know it's a product of its time, but I really wonder how Amanda feels about the way she portrayed feminists in this book now. She really just had this ridiculous caricature of radical feminists, and I'd be interested to know what she thinks of it today. Does she regret writing like this, or does she still support it? We finally, in the book, get a scene of Elle in an actual class and she gets the same shock that film Elle does, that she's just not prepared enough for the class she's in. But instead of being saddened by it and wanting to do better, book Elle is just bitter and it's clear that she doesn't even want to be there. After four years of arranging her college schedule in a creative now and then pattern, Elle had been crushed to learn three things about her law school classes. They were pre-scheduled, mandatory and daily, five days a week. Warner could walk in any minute, she reminded herself, glad she'd taken the time to dry her hair. She glanced back hopefully when the door swung open. Amanda's eternalised misogyny then shines through again as we're told that the professor of this class she's teaching is basically only teaching because she's married to the dean. <sighs> I hate it. In another class, Elle is made a fool of because she hasn't done the reading, but she tries to mimic her last professor by just quoting something they said about feminism. Um, only for the entire class to laugh at her. Elle wondered if this professor had a feminist theme too, like Kiki Slaughterhouse. Well, she attempted. It's endemic in our society, especially the subjugation of women. The class fell apart in laughter, leaving Elle to wonder alone what was so funny. Professor Glenn, whom the wags had renamed, who the wa whom the wags had renamed Professor Glenn Fidditch in recognition of the obvious difference between his lucid morning classes and his rambling red-nosed afternoons, shook his head sadly. He was sober today and appeared to regret it. Thank you, Miss Woods. Let's turn to somebody who's done the reading. Elle suspected she might learn more by staying home and watching Oprah anyway. She began daydreaming. If I was president, I'd put Oprah on the Supreme Court. Phil's too liberal. Geraldo's too insensitive. Larry King would, wouldn't take the pay cut. Ricky Lake? She paused considering. No, wouldn't get confirmed. But Oprah? Everyone knows she's fair, she's got enough cash to retire from TV, and maybe the tabloids would lay off her weight fluctuations if they only saw her in the black robe. Elle smiled. Definitely Oprah. Then the class ends, and there's this guy there that she's known from childhood, who's like, Elle! He caught her arm in the hallway gloating. This isn't Bel Air. You're not so popular here, you know. People don't even like you. He tightened his grip as she twisted away. Sydney held onto her arm as Elle moved down the hall, still trying to shake him. I have so many friends here already, Elle. You should be nicer to me. I might let you into my study group, Sydney snarled. Elle spun around and faced Sydney, yanking her arm free. Sydney, don't make this worse than it already is for me, she said. Please. Sydney's laugh was her answer. Elle tensed. Do me a favour, Sydney. You and your whole study group. What? Though she knew her efforts would be futile, she looked at him. Please, Sydney, just leave me alone. I'm glad this and the entire character of Sydney was just left out of the film entirely because it doesn't add anything at all. At this point in both the book and film, Elle goes for a manicure to cheer herself up a bit, to try and, you know, give herself a little self-confidence boost. 
So let's compare these two scenes. First, we'll start with the film. The film has Jennifer Coolidge as Paulette, the nail tech in the salon, and I love Jennifer Coolidge, so the film automatically wins for me. So much better. Superior in every way. <laughs> the book, on the other hand, has Josette not Paulette. Josette is also a nail tech that Elle likes to complain to about how terrible her life is, but whose work she clearly doesn't even respect. Do you want me to do a design? Josette asked, nodding in reference to Elle's nails. Please, how tacky. No thanks, I always do pinks. I brought a bottle of my favourite Chanel pink to keep here. So rude. And then there's like three pages of Elle just complaining about how awful all her classmates are, um, apparently including this guy who she mocks because he's actually enjoying the subject he's studying and that's a bad thing for some reason. Boring. He's not half as bad as Ben. Ben lives for law school. He watches court TV when he's not reading the Legal Times or briefing cases. He reads the Stanford Law School Review in the library when we have an hour break between classes. He looks like he's going to collapse under the pile of case books he's carrying around. He loves law school so much, he wants to stick around for more. He told me that ever since he was seven years old, he wanted to be a law professor. It's nothing but mean girl nonsense. Real, oh, terrible. The prize for law school success was this. An opportunity to slave away in a law firm library, researching obscure legal issues, perfecting a nervous twitch, and checking the clock in an obsessive fixation on billable hours in order to make money for someone else, more specifically a partner. This was called the partnership track. You sold your right to light and freedom for seven to eight good years, all in the name of an equity share and free time for golf. Clearly the author has nothing but a disdain for lawyers in general and the legal system in general and it's easy to see why none of the people she went to law school with allegedly want to speak to her anymore. Because of this, Book L just doesn't give a damn about the law either. All Book L cares about is that she doesn't know enough people to take notes for her so she can't skip classes. Boo hoo, what a shame, do your own work. The chapter ends with a throwaway line about how Elle is being kicked out of student halls for living with her dog. Let's compare this to the salon scene in the film. So just like in the book, um, film Elle goes to the salon because it's her safe place, her comfort place, and she needs a little pick-me-up. But instead of spending however many hours moaning about other people, film Elle instead has a little cry at first, she says what's wrong, and then she spends most of her time in the salon focused on helping other people. She has a good cry at first, but her attention quickly shifts to Paulette, who is also going through a recent breakup, and she wants to get her dog back, and um, Elle is really supportive of that, she tries to help, and Paulette also, mm, let's slip that maybe there's a new guy she's into, and Elle immediately notices and is like, oh, what are we gonna do about this, you know? The whole scene is amazing because it shows just how caring film Elle is and reinforces this whole message of girls helping girls. It's not just two women sat around listening to one be nasty about everyone, it's two women who were previously strangers and who come from very different backgrounds and have very different lives coming together to support each other and find common ground while they're both going through something difficult and they uplift each other and they make each other feel better and they support each other and it's beautiful. Back in the book, however, Amanda is just busy complaining about law school again. And might I remind you that this is something she chose to do. No one forced her into further, further education. Going to law school was an incredible priv privilege that she was offered and that her parents had to bribe their way into. And she is just repeatedly crapping all over it. It's so damn ungrateful. It's frustrating. Most classes in law school were an exercise in intellectual torture. Civil procedure laid out the ground rules for litigating cases in court. Anyone who could read and follow directions could understand civil procedure. You had to memorise concepts in order to bandy them about with the law students or spit them back on exams. But beyond that, L reason, there was no reason to know the law by heart. Also, it would be malpractice to practice off the top of your head. L was engrossed in a magazine and winced when Professor Erie called on Ben to answer a procedural qu question. They'd be in for another marathon of Ben unplugged. L was glad she bought the new Vogue. However, it's at this point that Elle makes a friend, and this friend is Eugenia, and she is. The woman wasn't a headband wearer, and unlike most of her classmates, didn't carry a coffee thermos with the emblem of her Ivy League alma mater. She was J. Crew, fresh faced, pretty with ivory skin and clear blue eyes. Plus, she was sort of blonde, or could be with some better highlights. It all sounds like alphabet soup to me, she whispered again with a grin. And apparently the best thing about Eugenia is that she's just as uninterested in classes as Elle is, and apparently this is a good thing. So they talk to each other in class by passing notes like literal children, not the 22 or 23 year old women they're supposed to be. After class, they decide to do the responsible thing and go day drinking and skip the rest of their classes. 
In the next chapter, we need a reason for Elle and Warner to spend more time together. In the film, it's because they both get chosen for an internship because Elle is working so hard and it's a great achievement for her, separate to being near Warner, but in the book, it's ridiculous. Warner calls her up and says, Elle, uh, I'm gonna call you earlier to see how things were going for you at law school. I've gotta say, I still can't get over the fact you're here, especially Stanford. As you probably know, Sarah, my fiancé, is in your section, and for what she tells me, you're still the same old Elle. Elle glared at the machine. I'll bet Sarah has plenty to say, she thought. Anyway, I should have called before, but listen. Daniel's coming to visit, and I promised I'd show him our videotape from Vegas. If you can lend it to me, I can make a copy, or just borrow it. Okay, honey? Elle warmed at the use of his word, honey. And then they introduce us to a whole unnecessary subplot. <sighs> I, I'm all for world building, but we didn't need any of this. This this whole thing could have been cut. And I'm going to read this to you with paragraphs already cut out. It did not need to be this long. Unbeknownst to his upper crust family, and probably to Sarah, Warner's secret persistent ambition was to direct films. He was an adulator of Martin Scorsese. For three years, he dragged Elle to film after film. And when he got a camcorder of his own, he began directing documentaries of their adventures. The videotape he'd asked about was a hilarious bumpy ride through the high-rolling weekend expedition of Elle, Warner and Warner's old prep school friend Daniel on the streets and in the casinos of Las Vegas. With only Daniel and Elle in the picture most of the time, except when Warner turned the camera on himself, uh, the eyewitness camera travelled from Siegfried and Roy's white tigers prowling their mirage jungle to a lost child crying in front of the treasure island ship, from a zoom in on one of the 100,000 minimum poker tables, interrupted by an unidentified hand and some shuffling bodies, to a sorry pile of ignored porn leaflets littering the dirty street, from Elle suggestively exposing her cleavage across a blackjack table in a badgely mishka dress, luminescent with stoli and cash from the glow of winning after hitting on 18, to Daniel arching one eyebrow, doubling down and betting smart. The documentary ended with the jacuzzi mirror reproducing upside down three wobbly revelers. Warner, his shirt undone, with the camcorder over his eyes, Elle leaning sleepily on Daniel, and Daniel winking, supporting Elle's drowsy blonde head on his shoulder. We didn't need any of this. Like, it's not even, not even relevant. All it does is give Warner an excuse to come around to Elle's house, but that's it. We didn't need, uh, mm. It's not actually relevant to the plot at all. <sighs> Elle then moves into a dog-friendly flat with a forgetful landlord, so she decides to invite Warner over to help her move and unpack all her heavy stuff, and she purposely hides the tape that he wants so he'll have to stay longer and help her move more stuff. Book Elle is really, really manipulative, and it only gets worse. Elle leaves him a message to be like, oh, come over, blah, 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 blah. But instead of Warner coming to help, Sarah's got his message and she turns up. And Sarah reddened with anger, then proceeded in a low, snarling voice. It's rather obvious, Elle, to anyone with half a brain at Stanford Law School, that you're having some trouble adjusting. Elle gasped in mock amazement, pat parting underdog's jaws with her hands, so the dog too peered at Sarah with open mouth surprise. Stop manhandling your dog like this! God's sake. Ugh. <sighs> We're having trouble adjusting, Elle said to her dog. Basically, Elle, you're the laughing stock of this school. I think there's a betting pool already with odds out on whether you make it through finals. Considering you have no friends and absolutely no chance of success as a law student, you might be looking for a, you might be looking for a shoulder to cry on right about now. So I came over to tell you one thing. Don't let it be Warner's. It sounded to Elle like Sarah had rehearsed his speech on the drive over, more or less, and the smug look on her face revealed that it had come out sounding better than she'd expected. She turned to exit grandly. Don't worry, Sarah. I'm not interested in Warner's shoulder at all. Sarah turned around tentatively. You're not? Tentatively. You're not? No, I'm not. Not at all. Elle smiled and stood up from the bed with Underdog cradled in her, her arms. Not one bit. Then she slammed the door in Sarah's face. And I think this meant to be some big moment of like, ooh, she's declaring war, but it just falls so flat. It's nothing. Compare this to the scene in the film, which instead of taking place at Elle's home, takes place in law class, where Elle is asked a question and she gives a well-meaning but naive answer and is laughed at by the class. Ms. Woods, would you rather have a client who committed a crime malum in se or malum prohibitum? Neither. 
And why is that? I would rather have a client who's innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Dare to dream. Vivian, the film Sarah, then jumps in to answer instead, giving the predictable answer, but one which shows understanding of the material. Ms. Kensington, which would you prefer? Malum prohibitum. Because then the client would have committed a regulatory infraction as opposed to a dangerous crime. Well done, Ms. Kensington. You've obviously done your homework. At which point Elle puts herself back in the conversation with, wait, I'm changing my answer to some legal term, blah, 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 because I'm not afraid of a challenge. It has been said. Yes, Ms. Woods. I changed my mind. I'd pick the dangerous one because I'm not afraid of a challenge. And it's a brilliant moment. That's the, ooh, I'm declaring war moment. That's the rivalry really starting up moment. Elle is far more active in it compared to the book. And she comes out on top. She actually wins. She's not being petty or lying or manipulating, but she wins by displaying her intelligence and being self-assured. It's brilliant. We love to see it. The book just keeps dragging on this boring nonsense though. Warner hadn't called back. Elle checked her watch. Criminal law was dragging on. The professor had turned to the board, drawing another worthless map to illustrate the federal court jurisdiction based on diversity of citizenship. Like, we get it, Amanda, you don't like law. Don't write a book on it then. Next up in the film, we get another scene that just isn't in the book at all. And it's really, really nice because it shows, again, the kind-hearted nature of Elle, despite not fitting in. So, Unlike Book L, Film L tries to make a real effort to fit in and make friends by studying more and actively trying to join a study group, but Vivian won't let her. Feeling dejected, she tries to leave the library only to be mocked by another woman, a feminist interestingly, who lashes out at L because she thinks L would have been the kind of person to bully her and use homophobic slurs. It's an understandable reaction from the feminist woman whose name I can't remember off the top of my head because I'm an idiot. Um, it's an understandable, understandable reaction from her as someone who's been hurt in the past, um, but it's also still showing that she has these misconceptions about Elle. And the scene is used here to show growth on both of their parts eventually. Phil Mel responds with kindness by telling her she'd never use those slurs or call people names like that. And in the end, uh, and in the end, the other woman, the feminist student, she realizes that crap, I might have been wrong. Hang on a minute, let me rethink this, reevaluate it. This could not be more different to how Book L behaves. We then get a scene in the film that is similar to the phone call scene in the book that L had earlier where she calls up her old friends. Um, but in this, it's slightly different because film L calls up her old sorority friends um, only to find that their lives have changed a lot. They've moved on and she starts to feel isolated from them. And she realises that not only are they moving on with their lives, but she's also changing and growing. And she's in that awkward in-between stage where she doesn't quite fully fit in with any group yet. Which is in stark contrast to the scene we saw earlier where Elle was just regressing. Uh, well, actually, because regression implies there's been some forward progression at some point and there just wasn't. Elle was just still her same old stagnant mean self, juvenile and nasty and joining in with the bullying, you know? Back in the book though, Warner finally agrees to help Elle with moving some stuff into her house so she goes to the salon to prepare and here is... I have things to say about Josette, the nail tech lady. I hate when characters in books are written with accents, like whatever the hell this is. Josette's ringlets shook briskly. No problem, no problem. We must do the whole hand. Painting coats over these two only, she explained. Ease no good. It will be uneven. Terrible. Here, she tapped the table. These hand. I've said before, I love, love, love when dialects are written into text because it can add so much. I'm from Yorkshire and Although I don't have much of an accent myself compared to some of my parents, the Yorkshire accent is so wonderfully distinct and it's part of our history and identity and culture that I love seeing that in text. I love seeing other people write with a Yorkshire accent. Um, other examples too that I've always loved in poetry are like, you know, uh, Benjamin Zephaniah was British and Jamaican and he always used to put his Jamaican dialect in his work and it was beautiful. One of my favourites, Grace Nichols, uh, 
she uses Guyanese dialect in a lot of her poetry and again it's beautiful, it's meaningful, it's a celebration of her culture, her language, it's using language to connect cultures and generations and I love it. That's not what happens here. When people write accents as a joke like Amanda does in this book or as other examples I've years ago now reviewed Shallon Lester's terrible attempt at fiction, um, she wrote some terrible, terrible attempts at accents and that, again, to mock them and everything like that. And it, it just feels cruel and unnecessary and disrespectful. And in some cases, I'm not sure in Legally Blonde because we never find out, like, what um, nationality Josette's meant to be, I don't think. But I think in a lot of cases, writing accents in a disrespectful way as a joke is just racist, you know, more often than not. Anyway, Elle continues to be scheming and manipulative and just stupid with things like, Elle grins sheepishly. Okay, okay, this is pretty embarrassing. Today I skipped my afternoon classes and moved some boxes and furniture out of my new condo, the stuff I'd just moved yesterday. I moved it back into my dorm room. It took a few hours, that's why I couldn't get here till late. Tonight I have to move it back to the condo all over again, but now Warner will help me. That is embarrassing, yes. The next chapter, Warner comes over to help Elle move her stuff, and just when we think, and just when we thought we couldn't think any less of him and Elle, uh, he cheats on his fiance with Elle, like proper, full-on cheats. Say it again: if he cheats with you, he'll cheat on you. You don't want to be with this man. No. The time had passed when it still made sense for Warner to be holding Elle's hand. He dropped to his knees, level with the couch, interrupting her words with a long kiss. She looked into his half-closed eyes. Why? Uh, she looked into his half-closed eyes with wide, adoring delight, and then suddenly, to her surprise, she giggled. All of her pointed yearning for this moment, all the tension waiting, evaporated into dizzy girlishness. Covering her mouth with her hand, Elle brushed Warner's face accidentally. I'm sorry, she gasped as she watched him draw back, looking perplexed and slightly angry. Warner stood up brus brusquely and moved to the door, trying not to show his anger and embarrassment. Elle had never laughed at him before. I should have left when we were finished moving. Just leave the videotape in my mailbox at school, okay? Sarah would kill me if she knew I was here. At the mention of Sarah's name, Elle's mood changed abruptly. She shook her head in self-reproach. What was I thinking, Warner? You don't want to be here. You've got a life. Practically a wife. All you want from me is that tape. Well, you don't have to kiss me for it. So he kisses her, and then he gets angry with her because she giggled? This man is a walking red flag. What a disaster. Underdog jumped playfully up on the couch. Hey there, Underdog, Elle said, scratching his head. I'd better start getting serious about all this reading for contracts. I think I just blew my marriage chances. She chased Warner to law school. She hated law school. Law school hated her. And Warner was hogtied by his fiance. On top of that, she'd become romantically challenged, reacting like a giddy teenager when Warner made his move. The next chapter and plot point is something that I'm also really glad was removed from the film. Elle gets a secret poem sent to her from her secret angel, uh, telling her not to drop out of law school. She peeled the envelope open and withdrew a single piece, a single page of white bond stationery. A poem marked with calligraphy done in strange scrawl of fountain pen ink caused her to gasp. I'm staring at your picture now. Don't be alarmed or nervous. I'm not so weirdo off. The, I'm not some weirdo off the street. I plan to do you service. I am your secret angel, and I'm sure you will agree that as I stare into your eyes, the pressure is on me. To give you gifts of cunning, to give you gifts of grace, to give you presents worthy of the beauty in your face. What better way to win your heart than with a simple rhyme? What better way to keep you here than with a class outline? Don't leave law school, L. You're one of a kind your secret angel. Can we all agree that this is creepy as hell? Awful. I don't care what the point, I don't care what their point was, if someone sent me an anonymous letter saying, I'm staring at your picture now, I would be terrified. Understandably. But basically, uh, um, but basically the point is, Elle is just so beautiful, she's so pretty, that she doesn't actually have to do any work anymore, because this secret admirer will be sending her class notes constantly. So the message is we should value beauty over hard work, because if you're pretty enough, everything just gets handed to you. Pathetic. 
girl leaned against the row of mailboxes, stunned by the cryptic offering. With an astonished quiver, she untied the stack of papers and read the thick black type at the top of the page. Blah, 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 blah. A quick peek at the pages confirmed what the poem had promised. Someone had given her class outlines. The key to law school success. Elle grinned broadly, tucking the papers into her Prada bag with confidence. Elle wondered who could have sent her such a gift. She is literally the opposite of film Elle in every way. She's terrible. Book Elle then spends the rest of the chapter making penis jokes in class before literally running out of class early, giggling like a child. Who writes this stuff? Next up in both the film and book, we get the party scenes. And let's talk about both of these. Let's start with the film. In the film, Vivian doesn't tell Elle about the party, but Elle overhears someone talking and is hopeful that someone will invite her, someone will include her, she can make a friend. This is followed up by Vivian lying and telling Elle that it is a costume party in order to purposefully embarrass her. When Elle turns up in a pink bunny outfit, everyone is objectifying or rude and laughing at her. In my head, this scene is like the precursor to the Halloween scene in Mean Girls, where, um... Katie, couldn't think of a name then, turns up at the party in the full scary gear while everyone else is dressed pretty. Similar vein to that, but honestly this is a trope that's been done quite a few times. In 2001, so the same year that Legally Blonde came out, we had the Bridget Jones party scene. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other examples, you guys probably name more down in the comments. Anyway, in the film we finally see Elle snap back and be mean to Vir to Vivian because she's had enough and she calls Vivian a frigid bitch. Probably not the nicest thing she could say but honestly understandable in the circumstances really. I think this is the first time, well this is the first time we see Elle be mean in this film and because of that it's quite surprising. It really shows that she has reached her limit. She has snapped and it's so impactful. If Elle was just this mean and rude to everyone then her calling Vivian a name wouldn't be impactful but all we've seen so far is her being nice and kind and understanding and nice and kind and when people look down on her she builds them up and tries to be nice to them. This time she snaps and she insults them back and that just shows us how much this means to Elle, how upset she is. It's it's impactful. It is the turning point of the film. It's also a really important point for uh, for Vivian's character development too because this is maybe the first time that someone has really spoken back to her like this and she's mad about it, you know? We see this look of anger on her face and her friend immediately backs her up. Um, just like Elle's friends used to back her up. So as an audience member, we're thinking, wait, does Elle think Vivian is the mean girl and Vivian thinks Elle is the mean girl? And we see, again, they're just like two sides of the same coin. Maybe they're not so different. This is where they begin to realise that maybe they're just treating each other badly because this is what society expects of them, not because they actually want to be doing this. And it's a big step towards them becoming better people and them becoming friends eventually. It's also at this party that we get a pivotal moment with Warner. Elle tries to be nice to him and she starts talking about all the work she's doing and how she's thinking of going for the internship, only for Warner to condescendingly tell her that she has no chance because she's not smart enough. You know, I feel like we barely get to see each other since we've been here. Oh, I know. I'm so busy with these case studies and hypos. I know what you mean. I can't imagine doing all this and Callahan's internship next year. This is going to be so much. Oh, Elle. Come on, you're never going to get the grades to qualify for one of those spots. You're not smart enough, sweetie. We see Elle literally back away from him, shocked. The literal moving away is symbolic of her emotionally distancing herself from him, realizing that he is an Anita realizing that he is an elitist snob who has always underestimated her and she is not okay with it. We see her physically moving back because she's emotionally moving back and she's realizing, crap, all I've done through this film is follow you and follow you and follow you. Now I'm like, nah, screw this, I'm going my own way. And this all culminates with her line, I'm never going to be good enough for you, am I? Wait, am I on glue or did we not get into the same law school, Warner? Well, yeah, but... But what? We took the same LSATs and we're taking the same classes. I know, but come on, I'll be serious. I'm never going to be good enough for you, am I? It's a moment where you see her heart literally breaking in front of you and the realisation dawning on her face, but you also know she's going to come out of this stronger and better and learning to focus on herself instead of some stupid man. 
we're almost halfway through the film now and this is the big moment, the big setback which is actually setting her up for success at the end. She marches right out of that party in her little bunny outfit and she goes to buy herself a computer in her little bunny outfit, showing that she is not fundamentally changing who she is, but she's finally ready to invest more in herself. It is also here that she bumps into Emma again and we see a very small moment in the queue where he just accepts her for who she is without question and it's lovely. We love Emma. I love Emma. I won't have a bad word said about Emma on this channel, okay? Wonderful. But... For a moment, let's go back to the book and see how the party scene is handled there. But let's cut back to the book for a moment and see how the party scene is handled there. Also, for comparison, the party scene happens about halfway through the film, like almost exactly halfway through, whereas it happens 25% of the way through the book, so the pacing is very different. In the book, Elle isn't invited to the party by anyone specifically, not Vivian slash Sarah. She just knows there is a Halloween costume party for law school and she is going and she's going to be wearing this ultra tight black getup that I actually used to wear to parties back when all that techno industrial music was hip. Never thought I'd say a sentence like that. <laughs> and then she spends the rest of the chapter mocking other students and saying that their regular clothes are scary enough to be Halloween costumes. You see what I mean? When the meanness from Elle is just this comment, it's not impactful if she says something mean to her rival, is it? Well, when Elle does turn up to the party, Elle parked her Range Rover on the quiet street and pulled down the vanity mirror. And pulled down the vanity mirror. Scary. Underneath a kinked blonde mop stared vicious circles of heavy black eyeliner and two cruel streaks arching from her eyelids upwards in a Cleopatra motif. Elle pulled out the cheap wet and wild lipstick found only in lesser drugstores and traced a shocking black smile. She grinned devilishly. Adjusting the metal spiked dog collar, Elle surveyed her extreme getup. Not to be toyed with, she laughed, feeling bold. Confidently, Elle and Underdog strolled across the lawn. Underdog was dressed as Dogzilla in a green scaled one piece costume. I admit that's adorable, okay? I like that. She wore hip length vinyl boots and a peak of fishnet on the inch of her thigh still visible beneath the leather micro mini. Studded skulls and crossbones on Elle's plunging leather vest gleamed in the porch light. Although she hadn't written down the address, she knew where the party was. But it turns out, oh no, she doesn't. She's at the wrong address. So she knocks on the door and a man says, no, no, no party here, then mistakes her for a prostitute and invites her in anyway, and then she just leaves. I was like, oh god, okay, is this like the bullying thing? Is she being given the wrong address? Did they give her wrong directions? Is there not actually a party? No, it turns out she's just too dumb to follow basic instructions. Like, that's genuinely what it is. After her humiliating brush with the solitary TV watcher, Elle was actually relieved to get to the party. As it happened, the house was the third from the intersection with Oxford Street. Following directions had never been Elle's forte. She was still blushing when she approached the open front door and headed for the noisy blend of music and chatter inside. What did any of this really add to the story? Nothing. Other than to make Elle more unlikable and infuriating and stupid. The party is uneventful for the most part. It is a costume party, Elle's got that right. She's judged a little bit by apparently being too sexual, but honestly it's not really a big deal and she seems to get more positive attention than anything. Um, she, try it, she does make some cruel comments towards people for no reason, like, if I wanted to degrade myself, Fran darling, I'd have come as a brunette. The only thing that really does happen at the party is that Warner shows up and agrees to go home with Elle if she agrees to not laugh at him anymore. <sighs> Ridiculous, I know. Um, and apparently Sarah, his fiance, isn't there because she's at home grieving for her family's dog and Warner's like, oh, you know what? While she's mourning, now's a great time to cheat on her. He's absolute scum. So they go back to Elle's and they have sex on the settee. Warner was true to his word and Elle was true to hers. He'd not stepped even a foot inside the doorway to Elle's apartment when she smothered him with kisses. Underdog hopped sideways to avoid being pummeled by the flurry of clothes that fell in a trail from the door to the couch. Elle had tears in her eyes as Warner's lips travelled down her neck to her bare shoulder. Suddenly he paused, laid his head on Elle's chest and sighed deeply. In an attempt to make Warner sympathetic, even though he's literally here, cheating on his fiance, he's all like, Oh, you, 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 I don't even want to be a lawyer, me, I just want to direct my documentaries, you, 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 you. Warner stroked Elle's soft hair, seeking solace from his trauma. What trauma? You've been given an amazing opportunity, and you're like, I don't want this, I want my other opportunity. That's not trauma. That's just privilege. 
Elle eventually tells Warner to go home because until you're true to yourself, you won't be able to love anyone. I think you better leave. I know. So both parties do end with Elle rejecting Warner to some extent, but one is actually empowering to Elle, the film, and the other is just a mess. Only in the film does Elle actually realise how awful Warner is and how badly he treats her. The book, they cheat and then she's like, oh, you need to love yourself more. I hate it. I hate it. Elle gets another creepy letter from her secret angel, who is now going by S.A., which really just screams sexual assault to me. An exhale empties out of the heart, an inhale fills the soul. Of all the dreams that I hold dear, to kiss her is my goal. A loving theft, theft, a loving theft, a pilfering, a joining of the lips, a trade of moisture, warmth and breath in soft and tiny sips. How slim my chances for this dream, I'll blindly roll the dice, and if she will not have me, then a handshake will suffice. One time she'll fill her chest with air, a trifle just to say, nice meeting you, and with this breeze, she'll blow my heart away. I belong to you, mon chéri, S.A. Elle fought a chill at her secret angel's intimacy. Too bad he didn't introduce himself today, she thought with a shrug. Shrug. I feel like kissing the world. I hate this book. He's gonna help me beat this place, Elle tingled with the relief. Impulsively, she planted her coveted kiss on the title page, leaving a pink heart-shaped imprint on the top margin. Margin. Fate had returned to fight in her corner. Ah. <sighs> Elle decides to take a trip back home in the book where her old friends have clearly started to leave Elle behind a bit and she feels out of the loop. It's here though that she hears about a terrible, terrible crime. Uh, one which those of you who've already seen the film might recognise. I still can't believe the most major crime happened right near my condo. It wasn't random or anything, it was a total hit. Chutney Vandermark's father is dead and her step-monster did it. If you're already a Malibu lawyer, you'd be really busy. Elle had long since ceased reading the newspaper or even people, but the name did strike her as familiar. Who? Margot grabbed the device out of her hand and flipped the channels until she found a hard copy. God, Elle, it's all over the major media. The voiceover told a grim tale as a dramatic reenactment of this crime scene appeared on the screen. Hayworth Vandermark, 74-year-old tycoon, his life taken not by his heart condition, but by a cold-blooded assassin. An actress portraying the dead man's daughter wailed to police investigators. I found his body right there, she pointed to a chalk outline. His wife was bent over the body trying to move it. The narrator continued. 23-year-old Brooke Vandermark, sixth wife, sixth wife of the slain millionaire, stands accused of the chilling murder in Malibu. An exclusive eyewitness interview with Hayworth Vandermark's only daughter, Chutney Vandermark, on this week's hard copy. So there's a few changes to the setup of the crime between the book and the film. In the film, they're much closer in age. Brooke is a few years older. I think she's meant to be like maybe 27, 28. And uh, her husband was just 60. So I have to say just, I mean, it's still an age gap, but it's less of an age gap and less creepy. Um, and also Brooke was in the same sorority as Elle but a few years before in the film. In this, she's only a year older than Elle and she was in like a rival sorority. That makes sense? So we have this whole setup and then it's just kind of forgotten about for a while while Elle goes on a date with a plastic surgeon who thinks she's a coke addict because in the bathroom she scratches under her nose with one of her long nails and it keeps bleeding, so he thinks she keeps getting nosebleeds from snorting too much cocaine. <sighs> None of this had to be in here. We, we didn't need this. The next few chapters are just total filler. A lot of time passes. Um, this is the point where we get like a montage in the film to show time passing. And in the film, this montage is Elle studying really hard while still doing the things she loves, like exercising, getting her hair done, all while studying. Uh, she's also participating in class more and getting answers right. There's a cute scene with Paulette where um, Elle helps her get her dog back and uses her new legal knowledge to help with that. Um, her hard work is paying off. She's using her newfound knowledge for good. It's lovely. Book L, on the other hand, decides to write an essay for class about why Madonna isn't a true blonde because she dyed her hair a hic a hair icky black and that when she's a lawyer, she's going to set up a blonde legal defence fund because blondes are just 
discriminated against constantly and she also goes home for Christmas to see her parents but nothing happens and then she gets ready for some exams but on the morning of her exams Warner sends back a bunch of photos of them together and Elle gets upset and is all like I can't do the exam boo hoo hoo stupid what annoys me though is even though this is Warner sending back the photos right Elle and her friend Eugenia, who is still around even though she's not made an appearance until now, um, both immediately blame Sarah for it. Like, sorry, but it's not her fault. Sarah didn't make her fiancé do anything. All of Warner's actions are his own. The cheating, the sending back photos, the mixed signals, all on him. Let's not blame a woman for a man's crappy actions, right? At this point in the film, Elle couldn't care less about Warner and what he's doing because she's her own woman now and she's focused on her own goals, but book Elle could not be more different. <sighs> Elle, I mean it! Eugenia grabbed Elle's shoulder, straightening her with a vigorous shake. You go get dressed and put this out of your head. Don't let Sarah or Warner, don't let either of them ruin what you've worked all semester for. Elle dropped her head and stared at the floor. I don't care if Sarah made him do it or not. I came here for Warner, Eugenia. He's who I've worked all semester for. Nobody else. I only wanted to show him that I could finish. Elle's quivering voice broke into a sob. Try to see what I see, Eugenia. I made an incredible mistake coming here. She reached for the letter, an anxious flush colouring her pale face, spotting her neck with crimson patches. Look, for every single case I read, for every class outline I fall asleep with my face on top of, what does Warner think when he sees me at school? Does he care that I've got a brain? That I can do anything his fiancé can do? Well, you can't, but come on. That I'm as serious as any proppy from Groton? No, he thinks perfect tan. My bikini shot. Elle restrained her voice with effort, wiping a tear angrily from her burning scarlet cheek. What, what difference will passing an exam make? Warner doesn't care and he never will. It won't change the fact that I'm not from Greenwich. I'll never be a Nottingham. I'll never be what he wants. And it's just become clear to me that I'll never be a Huntington. What's the point of keeping this up anymore? See what I mean? Book L is so frustrating. All she cares about is what some man thinks. The worst. L no. Eugenia then encourages L to go sit her exams anyway. She does. They don't go great. But spoiler, she scrapes a pass. But we'll get to that in a second. It's also at this point in the film and book that L decides to apply for an internship. In the film, she does it because... Um, her teacher, her professor, who is the one running the internship, is like, you're doing really well in class, so I would recommend you go for this. Please do it. Um, but with Book L, it's... When Eugenia told her that Christopher Miles was interviewing for research assistance on the Vandermark case, L developed a keen interest in getting the job, and when she saw Warner's name among the 40-odd students on the interview list, she made the internship her first priority. See, it's just so much more frustrating. Elle goes for the internship interview, and I admit there are little touches here that I did like. Um, so Elle printing her resume on pink paper, her wearing a cute pink suit to stand up, stand out. Uh, these are things that were translated into the film, and I liked it in both. Thought it was great. In the film, the internship is with her professor Callahan, and we will talk more about that later. Um, but the equivalent in the book is this guy called Christopher Miles, who's just a random lawyer. In the book, he briefs her about the case. There's not much new here that we didn't hear about earlier. And, all stuff that we know from the film and the case was kept pretty much identical in both if we're being honest the big difference though is that where um in the film brooke won't give her alibi because she was getting liposuction and she doesn't want to ruin her reputation in the book it's because she won't give an alibi because she told me she was at a group meeting a support group for home shopping network addicts shopper stoppers anonymous and she doesn't want to name anyone else who was there so during the interview, after receiving barely any information on the case, Elle declares that the blonde defendant is innocent because she's blonde, and a woman my age who marries a man that old on the hope that he doesn't write her out of his will and will leave it all to his daughter anyway, that's a woman who's willing to work for her money. That man has been married almost as many times as Larry King, for God's sake. He knew how to file divorce papers, but he kept Brooke around. That's honest work. Hard work keeping a rich man happy, anyone who marries for money ends up earning it. I hate this. I hate this. It's disgusting and I hate it. Elle also decides that Chutney the daughter must be guilty because she's a brunette. And also... <laughs> anyway, Brooke didn't do it. She didn't kill Hayworth Vandermark. He paused, surveying Elle with care, but sceptically. Oh, how convenient. Do you also know who did it? Chutney did it, Elle declared, already on the stand... Already on the side of wholesome, blonde innocence. Well, I only know a little of the facts, but from what you told me, it's got to be Brooke or Chutney. 
Brooke, I tell you, was making honest money putting up with a testy old dinosaur who married and divorced on a whim. Chutney, though, the late-in-life kid, those kind think they're entitled. They never see their parents struggle or grow up. They just see this old lump between them and their inheritance, breathing its last intolerable breaths. Elle then flirts with Christopher, her interviewer and soon-to-be boss, and asks him for dinner as a date because... reasons. It's appropriate, I guess. Elle folded her sunglasses and slipped them into their case, blinking with an anxious smile. She noticed soft glints of grey that streaked Christopher Miles' dark hair about the temples. She wondered if he'd been divorced, thought it likely as a matter of odds, but at the same time instinctively doubted it. He was exceedingly graceful. His gaze rested easily wherever he turned it. The air about him was that of a man who belonged. He was successful, welcome, and unhurried. He had the maturity of calm knowledge without the vinegar of hard experience. Elle had never dated an older man who did not fancy himself a young one. She didn't realise until the waiter approached that she'd been staring into his steady, hazel eyes. This seems inappropriate. The other big change between Brooke in the film and Book is that in the film... Brooke is obviously like a fitness expert and, you know, she made her money because she lost a lot of weight doing all these exercise regimes and blah blah blah. Shock is like, oh, it's liposuction and yeah. Um, this is still true in the book, but the body shaming aspect of everything is just way more prominent and it's really gross. Like, Elle says stuff like this, that Brooke would never have killed her husband because she used to be fat and she would bet her life that Christopher Miles had never dated a fat girl. Warner certainly hadn't, she thought in gentle reproach. It must have been half a Brooke. Don't you see? She made something of herself, Elle protested. She worked for every pound. She's not a woman who takes the easy way. And then there's just more comments like this. There's a whole backstory about how she was kicked out of her soror sorority house at uni for not being ashamed of photos of herself when she was bigger. And Elle and all the other girls call her all these mocking names and nonsense. It just it doesn't sit right with me. It's gross. I don't like it. Elle is somehow selected for this internship along with three other students. There's one called Carrie who's selected because she actually has the relevant work experience. And then Sarah and Warner are also selected because Christopher knows their dads and it's just nepotism. Awful. And then, of course, the chapter ends with Elle bringing it back to... Uh, well, Christopher nodded. You said you felt sorry for Brooke and you asked me if she was blonde. Sarah rolled her eyes and Carrie looked away looked angrily at Christopher Miles, who she thought was flirting with Elle. She is, Elle smiled. I knew she was. I could tell. Any 23-year-old marries... Any 23-year-old married to a 74-year-old with a heart condition is a blonde. I guarantee it. The film does cover a lot of, like, s the similar ideas, but with more of a focus on Elle saying things like she couldn't have done it, exercise gives you endorphins, happy people don't shoot their husbands, instead of Elle saying that Brooke was with her husband because she was working hard for money, you know? Film Brooke also makes it clear that she actually did love her husband and was with him because she was attracted to him and liked him and she didn't care for money because she had her own, you know? So less weird misogynistic undertones in the film. So as the work actually starts in the film, we'll talk about the film first, yeah. Um, you might remember that Brooke refuses to tell anyone her alibi except Elle. Elle refuses to tell anyone because Brooke has to keep it a secret. And there's a great scene in particular where Elle is talking about the sacred bonds of sisterhood that she wants to keep and all the men are shouting at her saying that she's got to tell them the alibi and she's like, nope, sorry. And then Warner is like, just tell, you'll probably get a better job off from Callahan if you do. And she's like, nope, loyalty comes first love that. And then the whole blonde brunette thing does come up in the film, but it's not like glorified like it is in the books. It's challenged, which I really like. So there's a scene where Elle and Emmett go to meet the dead guy's ex-wife and Chutney's mum. And Elle says that she doesn't trust her because she's a brunette, but this isn't just accepted. Instead, Emmett challenges her and tells her that she can't say something like that. And film L responds with like, well, why not? I'm discriminated against for being blonde. But Emmett instead responds by saying, there's actually power in that. You can use your blondness if you want to and blah, blah. And they turn it into this big discussion. And they turn what is a horrible discriminatory point in the books that's just nasty stereotyping into a moment of learning and growth for Elle. And it's really nice to see. Meanwhile, back in the books, there's just chapter after chapter of Elle complaining about more classes that she's taking and how much she hates them and why she hates them and how awful all the professors are and they're so ugly and they're boring and it's all just mean and unnecessary. I don't want to read this. 
In the film, Elle takes her internship and meeting Brooke really, really seriously, but we don't get the same in the book. When Elle is finally taken to meet Brooke in the book, it's during a deposition with some interior designer who hates Brooke, but is actually really good friends with Elle. And despite this and despite this being what should be a really important like learning moment for Elle, she just doesn't take it seriously. And we get passages like Elle smiled at Trent, the designer, and sat down silently next to Christopher, backing her chair from the table to balance the legal pad in her lap. While she waited for Hen Henry Cohn's secretary to pour water into glasses from a heat-condensed silver platter, Elle began sketching Brooke's earrings. Dangling from each of Brooke's ears were two small hoops in which two identical naked twins linked arms. Twins! Gemini, thought Elle to herself, ruled by the planet Merc Mercury, longs for affection and understanding. Good thing she'd taken Zodiac and you for her planetary science requirement at school. When she'd finished Brooke's earrings, she began sketching Pisces earrings and wondered how to distinguish them from Aquarius. It occurred to her that Aquarius was an air sign, but rather than puzzle it over any longer, she drew a bull, which was definitely a Taurus. She'd never considered Taurus a woman's sign, but she figured she could market the earrings to men and women in Miami Beach or San Francisco. The Libra scales reminded her of law school, and Elle began drawing earrings with legal with a legal theme which she felt was more appropriate given the circumstances. By the time the deposition ended, a model resembling Brooke was scribbled on Elle's legal pad adorned with Libra scale earrings and a necklace pendant in the shape of a gavel, and a bracelet with various case books for charms. I hate it. I, I hate this book. What am I doing with my life? This is then followed by more weird boundary crossing where in the book, Brooke is out on bail and she's gonna move in with Elle for a few days before the trial or during the trial or something, something, something. And then Christopher's taking Elle out to dinner again. And can we please not glamorize older men taking advantage of students that they hire, please? Just, can we not? Another section that's thankfully left out of the film is this whole Valentine's Day portion. In the book, Elle gets just so many cousin presents because she's just so pretty and attractive and yee, 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 I hate it. This also happens to be the day that grades are released and Elle assumes that Sarah hasn't done very well because she sees her crying and gets really mean about it. To her dismay, Elle found herself walking directly behind the twosome, but when she noticed Sarah was wiping her eyes and sniffing, Elle paused with curiosity. What could Sarah possibly have to cry about? I'm the one without a date on Valentine's Day. Sarah squeezed her report card in one hand and clutched several crumpled Kleenex, Kleenex in the other. Other. Elle gasped. Her grades. A rush of excitement consumed Elle. Sarah was crying over her grades. She strained her ears to hear more information with the singular concentration of an animal bent on its prey. If Sarah had failed her classes, and if Elle had managed to squeak by, then Elle would have worn it all to herself. It was as if a genie had appeared from a magic lamp and granted her most impassioned wish. Sarah could be gone in a puff of Stamford's harsh air. Peeking at Sarah, who was bl blubbering in woe, it seemed too good to be true. Cruel. But wait, there's a twist. You should be thrilled with your own grades, Sarah. I'm sure you're at the top of our class, Claire gushed. I don't know anybody whose grades are as high as yours. Be happy for yourself, at least. Warner will find his way. Claire paused and then said with hesitation, Warner can't be good at everything, Sarah. Maybe law school just isn't his thing. What if it's just a rumour that Stanford doesn't kick anyone out? Warner's barely coping with the shock of his grades now, but if he had to head back to Newport under a cloud like that, the black sheep... Sarah choked. I don't know what would happen to him. To be honest, I don't know what would happen to us. Tears began to pour down Sarah's blotchy cheeks. Elle's heart plunged. There was no wish from a genie lamp. It was the worst possible turn of events. It was Warner who was in danger of failing out, and if Elle stayed in school, he would be as far out of reach as ever. Father. He would be gone, and she'd be left with Sarah, reveling at the top of the class. Suddenly her mind jumped to the unopened report card in her red patent leather bag. Maybe she'd done no better. You know what, I'm fine with Warner failing and dropping out of school. That's fine, get rid of him. I'd like to see that, actually. And again, it just shows that how he did not deserve this internship he was just given. I just, ooh, annoys me. Mm. Still, the author manages to turn all of this into the women's fault. Sarah starts complaining that she doesn't want to be propping Warner up all her life. Excellent point, she can do better, she deserves better. But it just devolves into her crying that, but I don't want him to be with that Barbie doll. Being with her already damaged his reputation. And me, 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 me. It's ridiculous. I hate it. And then there's just, oh, there's a scene. I don't know what to think of it. And I hate it. And I hate this book. You know what? My battery's going to die. I'll film it in a bit. So this scene that I have 
many thoughts about. We kind of start to see some growth from Sarah, but also it's not exactly good growth. I mean, it seems like it's going to be at first and then it's not. And then Elle is just, I, I'm just going to read this to you and you can see what you think. Because, bleh. So Sarah's friend leaves and she pulls Elle aside and takes her into this classroom and is like, can I talk to you? Blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry, Elle, Sarah said, peering at her. She spoke in a muffled voice. I acted like a child. I feel so stupid. Elle squinted, skeptical of the convenient apology from her otherwise hateful adversary. Sarah sniffed and turned her eyes back to the floor. This is the most mature we see anyone act in this entire book. Just that. Look, Sarah choked back a sob. I know I have no right to ask you this, but I need your help, Elle. And I don't mean this condescendingly, so please don't take it the wrong way. Elle, Warner's grades will put him at the bottom of the barrel if he's even allowed to stay here. They're so bad, Sarah whined. I'm afraid it'll be hard for him to live with my success, but Warren is different, isn't he? She's, he says he admires my serious attitude towards school, my dedication. Elle cringed. I tell myself he'll love me even more when he finds out about my grades. Sarah halted, resting her head in her hands. I don't know, Elle. She spoke to the floor. Elle wondered if Sarah was setting up to interrogate her about whether Cosmo might have an answer, but Sarah turned her eyes to Elle imploringly. You know Warner, Elle. You dated him, you know what he's like, and he always tells me how you know what he likes. She halted, blushing that she had admitted Warner talked about Elle. Will he be happy for my success, even if he fails at the same thing? With a heavy sigh, Elle decided to tell Sarah the truth. Warner does admire your dedication, Sarah. He values your seriousness, you're right about that. And more than anything, he admires your background, she added, flashing Sarah an icy glare. But Warner loves competition. He's not different like you hope he is. He despises losing. He'd be happy for you, if he'd done well himself. Then you'd be proper then you'd be a prosperous shining couple, the envy of your set. That hasn't happened. So what does that mean? Warner wants accompaniment from a woman, Elle said, raising her chin with a haughty gesture. He doesn't want to be graced by your success. Sarah stared at the floor and didn't respond. Warner won't love you because you did better than he did. Elle said, he won't love you because you've succeeded. She paused and quietly. She paused and added quietly, Sarah, if he does love you, he'll love you in spite of that. Warner's a pig. We hate Warner. Who wants to be loved despite their success? Like, ooh, hate it. If Elle was a good person, she'd tell Sarah that she deserves better, but Book Elle is not a good person. We hate Book Elle. Sarah sat motionless, but Elle felt her rival had grown sceptical. Elle knew that what she'd said about Warner was true. She sat forward, leaning her elbows on the desk, and explained. Sarah, don't you see that Warner loves himself as much as he has room to love anything? He won't love you one bit more for your achievement. It didn't do anything for him. Sarah took off her wool cardigan, placing it on the, back, on the chair back. You want Warner's love? I'll tell you how to get it. Make him believe you think the sun waits to rise until he gets up, Elle said matter-of-factly. Unqualified admiration. That's what keeps Warner going. She, con she considered what she'd told Sarah. In some measure, she regretted giving away any insight that might help Sarah smooth out the tension in their relationship, which, if played wrong, could give Warner doubts about his bride-to-be. But part of her was laughing, imagining Sarah taking her advice. Sarah, humbly attending to Warner's almighty ego. Sarah, hiding her own success like a fault. For once, Elle didn't envy her. I hate this whole book. <laughs> It's also revealed at this point that Elle has passed all her classes, which she took pass-fail. I didn't really know what this meant, because I think it's an American university thing. It's not a UK university thing, or at least not the university I went to. Um, but I did some Googling, and from what I can tell, and please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, while taking a class pass-fail can be good for some students in some circumstances, in some subjects, it seems like it's not a good idea to take all of your classes pass fail um, because it means it's more about just doing the bare minimum to pass rather than being really motivated to try your best and learn something to the best of your ability and in certain degrees it means that you won't like graduate with honours and stuff like that and I, I don't know maybe you guys can help me out in the comments. Elle also receives Valentine's Day flowers from still engaged to another woman Warner which is another reason Sarah should dump him immediately. I find it really hard to speak today, I'm sorry. I was tripping over all my words. Speaking of Sarah, Elle is just back to being absolutely mean and nasty to her in the next scene for no reason. I just don't get it. Elle poked her friend when she saw Sarah enter the room. 
Check out the power suit, she giggled, indicating Sarah's severe figure approaching in her Navy Brooks Brothers uniform with a paisley bow strangling her neck. Hey, is this dress like your mother day? Eugenia whispered. Certainly not my mother, Elle laughed. Grow up. So that scene with Sarah being like, is Warner going to be intimidated by me, blah, blah, That was meant to be a moment of bonding for Sarah and Elle, but it's just completely overshadowed and ruined by Elle being mean and the whole Warner thing. And it's terrible. I hate it. I hate it. In comparison, the film has a nicer but more subtler moment of growth for them both. And it's as simple as Vivian giving Elle this little look of respect when she won't share Brooke's alibi with everyone, even when all the men are telling her she should. And then later... Uh, Kubi, she's outside. Um, and then later, Vivian tells Elle that she thought that what she did was very classy of her. Oh. You know, Elle, I still can't believe you didn't tell Callahan the alibi. It's not my alibi to tell. I know. And I thought that was very classy of you. Really? And at that point, Vivian opens up about feeling that she's not taken as seriously as some of the men in the internship and how she's always asked to get coffee, but the men never are. And then they both kind of have this little bonding moment about how it's tough for women sometimes in male-dominated environments and how men aren't as great as they seem. Um, Warner's lack of achievement is brought up here too, but in the context of him getting waitlisted for law school and his dad having to pull some strings to get him ill, get to, and his dad having to pull some strings to get him in in the first place. But Elle never once tells Vivian to hide her own achievements or dumb herself down for him or anything like that. Instead, they just share a little giggle. They talk about Bruiser, the dog. They give him a cuddle and a pet together. And, I mean, he is the true star of this film, let's be honest. Um, and it's just a very sweet moment, um, as opposed to that sad, frustrating one in the book. Did you ever notice how Callahan never asks Warner to bring him his coffee? I mean, he's asked me at least... Ten times. Well, men are helpless, you know that. Did you know when he first applied? He got waitlisted. What? His father had to make a call. You're kidding. <laughs> no way! <sighs> oh, God, that is such a precious dog. Hi. His name is Bruiser. Do you want to hold him? Oh. He's very friendly. Sure. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Look, he likes you. Oh, he's giving me kisses. And then, you'd have thought maybe with them bonding, this would be a good time for Elle to open up about the fact that Warner cheated on her with her... No, cheated on Sarah with her, but d no, it's never mentioned. Sarah never finds out. It's just brushing on the carpet like, oh, it happened, never mind, let's move on. Let's pretend that wasn't a terrible thing they did. It has no consequences, I hate it. At this point in the book, Brooke has come to stay with Elle for a few days, and this involves conversations about uh, birth control, for example, where Brooke says, It's a tool to limit our life force. If I'd seen it a year ago, maybe I would have had Hayworth's child. He wanted to, you know. She began to cry softly. Shut up. At this point, Elle also reflects on how she's drifting apart from her old sorority friends back home, but she's still not learning anything, as she says, they were friends of habit and memory, to which she now clung like lint. She sensed that she'd lost them coming to law school, maybe for good, and then maybe inevitably. Either way, she was left with a sense of loss. She'd strayed from her old life and had found fulfilment where she least expected it, but she still hadn't given up on getting Warner back. Law school had not changed her in Warner's eyes, so she'd found a way to get him, with Brooke's case as a front and the L he had loved as the bait. It's terribly written. She'd see Warner after class, and she'd be holding a property textbook in one hand and a deposition in the other. But to him, she might as well have been holding a dog-eared copy of Cosmo. So Cosmo it would be. Elle had a plan to work out at the gym available to Miles and Sl Slocum employees. That's where she's doing her internship. Positive that she'd run into Warner there. She dutifully packed her gym clothes and the latest Cosmo to read while she was on the Stairmaster. The rest of her class looked upon her like an alien. Barbie paraphernalia still made its cowardly, anonymous assault on her school mailbox. She found herself bored in classes which she attended with less and less frequency. She sighed and Brooke's obstinate expression caught her eye. We're now 72% of the way through the book and Elle has not grown or changed or improved at all. This is just frustrating to read. So Elle goes to the gym, but it turns out Warner isn't there, but Sarah is. Sarah says that Warner wants her to work out 
because he's trying to change her. Um, so he's making her do Elle's exact gym routine because he wants her to look more like Elle. It, oh, disgusting. This man is awful. What's he going to do next? Cut off Elle's face and place it over Sarah's. <laughs> Instead of telling Sarah to dump him like she should do, and, you know, do whatever she likes with her own body. Strangely, Elle agrees to teach her how to use the gym to do her workout, so they're pandering to crappy men again. Sick of men. In the next chapter, we find out who Elle's stalker, I mean, secret admirer is, um, and it's a man called Larry, who I don't remember actually ever having seen or read about in this book before. So, who is he? He does and says creepy things like, yeah, she didn't know Larry had followed her out until he caught up with her in the hall. Elle, wait up. She turned and sounded surprised. Larry stared intensely at Elle walking next to her. She fished in her purse for her car keys, nearing the parking space where her trusty ra Range Rover was primed for exit. Elle, Larry said as he placed a hand on his hip and watched her struggle through the clinking contents of her bag. You're too sexy for law school. Jezebel, my painted Jezebel. <laughs> Larry shifted lyrically into the Old Testament, extending one arm as if he was heralding Elle to a royal audience. See to this accursed woman and give her burial. After all, she is the king's daughter. Elle glanced up from her purse, surprised. Jezebel, what on earth are you talking about? Larry leaned against a Range Rover, gazing at Elle with a dreamy, quiet calm. A loving theft, a pilfering, a joining of lips, a trade of moisture, warmth and breath in soft and tiny sips. He paused, watching her mouth drop in astonishment. You're the secret angel, Elle cried, recognising the verse from her outlines. Every true romantic needs his Guinevere, Elle. Larry's gaze seemed detached, his John Lennon sunglasses hiding, hiding a world only glimpsed by his eyes. Oh, Larry, they're so unique, she said. Your poems, so inspired. <laughs> she paused, gazing at the English professor gone wrong. But why on earth are you wasting your talents in law school? Elle, he smiled. My talents aren't wasted. A. Lawrence Hesterton turned back towards the House of Law. A poet needs but one, he said quietly. <laughs> Elle rested her weight against the car door and watched her secret angel depart. The unlikeliest people, she thought to herself, com confounded by this flash of Larry's private mind. Now that she knew it was someone who was with her and saw how she'd struggled in all her classes, she decided if, sh if she was his Guinevere, he was her... Palo Alto Night. I I hate this whole plot point. It's weird and stupid and I hate it all. Then there's just chapter after chapter after chapter of Elle just reading magazines in class and getting answers wrong again and again and again. Again, there's no growth. What is the point to any of this? Also, I hate Book Brooke. Brooke in the film is fine. She's great. Like, I like the actress. She's fine, whatever. Book Brooke, which is really hard to say, um, is horrible. And her and the author push this narrative that just, oh, women just want to be married as soon as possible, and a woman needs to be married. If she doesn't want to be married, what's wrong with her? You should be trying to get married. It doesn't matter if you have aspirations, you need marriage. Elle laughed. So what are you going to do now? What do you mean, Brooke asked. After the trial? Elle nodded. Well, if Christopher keeps me out of jail, I'll get married again. Brooke wrinkled her nose and squinted at Elle quizzically. Of course. Any prospects, said Elle, grinning. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Brooke shook her head, struck by Elle's naivety. What else would I do? I'll be married by year's end, no question. Aren't you going to get married? Elle grew quiet. Not by year's end, she admitted. Well, anyway, she added, probably not. <laughs> it's so poorly written and it's terrible. And then Elle talks about her career and says, blah, 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 she wants to be a jewellery designer. This jewellery is jewellery, I'm not, I'm not reading all of this, it's boring. But the whole law school thing feels like it's been for nothing. So what is the point of this book? Clearly she's just going to like drop out after a year and become a jewellery designer. Why did we need this? Why, why does this book exist? This is not a story that needed telling. This is barely a story. And then the chapter ends with a line, Elle followed Brooke to the parking lot where the Mercedes owner was obvious from its license plates alone. I-S-O-S-W-M. I didn't get the joke, but I had to Google it and it stands for In Search of Single White Male. So, gross. A little later in the book, Warner invites Elle out to dinner. The man who I will remind you again is still engaged to Sarah. Hate him. Um, and they have this riveting conversation where he's all like, oh, gee, de, be, de, be, de, be. I'm a different man lately. Oh, you know me so much better than Sarah. Blah, de, be, de, be. Sarah's so terrible. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then it just goes on and on. And I was going to read out this whole passage, but what's the point? What What is the point? Basically, Warner just leads L on and she's like, this is it. He's finally going to propose to me. Blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, I've made a decision. I'm going to start playing golf. I hate this book. L ends up crying in the bathroom and then the scene just ends. And then we get a scene in some sort of classroom somewhere or something like that, I don't know, uh, that weirdly L isn't in because she's been in every other scene in this book, but she's not in this one. And we get to hear some stuff from Sarah's perspective. And we start to be realizing that maybe she's realizing Warner is a crappy little man. Sarah chatted nervously with Warner, glancing at the crown of hostile ex Mrs. Vandem. Oh, it's in a law thing. That's it, like for the case. Sorry. Um, Sarah chatted nervously with Warner, glancing at the crowd of hostile ex Mrs. Vandermarks who were primping in cont compact mirrors to avoid speaking to one another. Some first case, she remarked. Yeah, he responded, looks grim. He searched the courtroom for Elle, who had not yet arrived. Wonder where Elle is? Sarah had noticed Warner wondering about Elle a lot and was not oblivious to the fact that when it wasn't Elle, he would still wander wand wonder about and wander towards other women she felt weighed down by the rock yes dump him he's a cheating piece of crap the next few chapters end up focused on trial stuff but the book cares more about focusing on who will inherit the money and the validity of the will rather than worrying about who actually killed this guy it's very will focused and the law around the wills and that sort of thing as opposed to a murder trial like it is in the film it's fine, I guess. Kind of boring. The writing isn't the best. It's a bit confusing all over the place. The author keeps throwing in random insults about any woman's appearance, but other than that, I have little to say. And then out of nowhere, we get um, another awful Warner scene of Warner being awful. Can you tell I hate Warner yet? So he just pulls her aside for no reason. He's like, L, I don't know. It's been so weird to see you all suited up like this, asking these legal questions, these basic questions. Elle frowned. What do you mean, basic? He approached her more delicately. Elle, for God's sake. You're so creative. Remember all the jewellery stuff you used to be into? I don't know. Are you even keeping up? What do you mean, Warner? Elle retorted. Her stare was sharp and pointed. What about all that you said at dinner? She recounted the, his words bitterly, all to Warner's quiet acknowledgement. Remember, she goaded, desperate to shake any response from his terrible silence. Remember how you were so impressed seeing me in law school but not caving? Not blending into this horrible herd? Get over yourself, L. Warner ended the barrage of questions. This has to do with me, not you. He glared at her annoyed. L suddenly realised she had the effect of raising self-doubts within him. He hadn't asked her to come to law school to make trouble for him. L lost, L lost her patience with him, with the whole situation. She had more important things than people to think about. Take your own advice and get over yourself, Warner. I certainly have. Elle turned and began walking away from him. He grabbed her shoulder and tried what he thought was a flattering approach. L, listen, this law school thing is ridiculous for you. I mean, let's face it, who are you trying to impress? Really, women like Sarah, they go to law school. They belong in law school. Come on, do you really see yourself as a lawyer? Which, none of that is as impactful as the scene in the film where he calls her stupid at the party, is it? It just... <sighs> anyway, thankfully Elle ends up having, like, a tiny bit of self-respect and growth and she walks away from him, which is good. Um, there's more trial stuff, lots of it's similar to the film, just kind of dragging stuff out. Brooke has an alibi, won't give the names back up, blah blah blah. Then they do bring up this extra point by pointing out that um, her new car's registration plate, the in search of single white male thing, is in poor taste, which, you know, while you're suspected of killing your husband, yes, I think it's in poor taste. Brooke, again though, in the book is horrible. Um, Brooke cocked her head, staring coldly at Henry Cohn. Yes, in fact, I am, as you say, on the market. Not in the classifieds, just on my car. But I didn't plan to be. She scowled at law students hiding their trickling faces, feeling her feminine allure had been questioned. I'm doing my best, Mr. Cohn, Brooke explained, to put together a new life thanks to some sicko who gunned down my husband. She glared at Chutney, who stared indifferently at the floor. And anyway, Hayworth wouldn't wanted, would have wanted me to remarry. The witness sniffed, eyes rolling to heaven as she, as if imploring his ghost. All he ever wanted was for me to be happy. Brooke's shoulders shook with a sob. She peered red-eyed at the judge, quivering. And then it's Chutney's turn on the stand. And this is the climax of the book, or at least it should be. Um, this is Elle's moment to shine and show off what a good lawyer she is and, you know, come into her own and... 
Um, it, it, oh, it's so lackluster compared to the film. We'll we'll talk about the film version in a minute, but let's finish the book first. In the book version, Elle is just sat back in the courtroom quietly, and she does notice the same mistake in Chutney's testimony. Um, however, it well, uh, she's just bored, and she's spending a lot of time complaining about Chutney's hair being frizzy and blah, 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 saying Elle twirled her hair, wondering if she should braid it to keep herself awake. Better not. She didn't want it to frizz like Chutney's. Glancing at Chutney, Elle remembered her first and only perm and wondered why anyone paid money to have their hair ironed into wrinkles. Can we not with this idea that only straight hair is attractive, please? It, ooh, it's offensive. And then in both the book and the film, Elle comes to the realisation that, wait, you said you got a perm as your, like, alibi that day, but then you took a shower, but you couldn't have been in the shower washing your hair if you just got a perm. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh my god, my knowledge of hair care saved the day. And it's all cool. It's nice. It's fun. Um... This feels like more of a payoff in the film because we know Elle has actually bothered to do the legal work to get to this moment so the triumph feels more earned and it's this beautiful blend of her like previous knowledge and her new knowledge coming together to save the day but in the book it's it's just like it goes through one horrible witness after another. Elle does nothing but sit in the background and moan. Brooke is so awful that you almost don't want her to win this case at all because she's just a nasty person. Um, Whereas, like, in the film, you're actually rooting for Brooke, and you see there is this genuine big conspiracy against her, like, and again, in the film, Elle does more than just, like, one thing, because she's the one who uncovers this whole conspiracy and makes it known. So, in the film, there's this whole thing of, like, the pool boy saying that he had an affair with her and he's lying about it because it's the big conspiracy, and even though Elle figuring this out relies a little bit on harmful stereotypes of, like, ooh, he must be gay because he knows shoes, which isn't great, let's be honest. At least it's an example of Elle being observant and intuitive and having great social awareness, as well as her legal knowledge. So Elle steps up and um, so Elle steps up and saves the day and it's great there. And then in the film you also get like Emmett showing that he has complete faith in Elle and taking a risk because he believes her, which again is lovely to see. None of that happens in the book. Elle doesn't actually do anything during the trial except here's what I know about perms and that is it. What happens after the trial is also way worse in the book, um, not really for any serious reason, it's just ridiculous, like try and listen to this without cringing. Oh today I'm free to be me, free to be me, there goes Chutney said it was me, Brooke sang, bouncing along with her flowery little cheer. Elle burst out laughing. God Brooke, it's a miracle you weren't so goofy on the stand. Elle poked Eugenia, grinning with wide-eyed relief. Meet Eugenius, she announced to Brooke, the smartest girl in Stanford Law School. I wouldn't have made it here without her. Group hug, announced Brooke, hauling Eugenia into a merry circle. You're the smartest girl in law school, Eugenia declared, freeing her hand to rustle Elle's hair into a white, moppy mess. You cannot convince me that anyone reading this book for fun actually enjoyed it. Not possible. I will not believe it. And then we get the final bit between Warner and Elle where she turns him down because thankfully, thankfully, even book Elle doesn't end up with Warner. She sees that he's crap and walks away from him. Um, his big attempt at a declaration of love that was even more offensive than it is in the film. And I know I'm making a lot of comparisons to the film here, but I'll talk about it in detail in a second. Um, he's in the book. Warner says, Elle, come on. You know, I thought I'd have to marry Sarah because she, oh God, Elle, she had the brains and everything. You know my family. I mean, I wanted to be with you really, but everyone, everyone thought you were so flaky. Warner laughed heartily with Elle, who encouraged him with a warm gr gasp, grasp, oh, to continue. A frosted flake, me, Elle giggled in faux humility, glancing to assure herself that Sarah heard. A little old Barbie doll me. Oh, come on, Elle. You act like the biggest bimbo around, Warner chuckled, positive that Elle shared his humour. I mean, you should just hear what people say about you at law school. Confident that he'd won her back <laughs> with insults, um, he put his arm around her shoulders and jostled her like a friend. I'm so glad they're wrong. You showed everybody. I'm so glad I can be with you again now. Warner pulled Elle close to him. You want me back, Warner? Elle peered up from her old love's embrace with sweet doe eyes, trying not to laugh. Elle, I'll leave Sarah, he gushed. I don't need her anymore. You are smart. 
Christopher and my father go all the way back to prep school, and with the glowing description he'll give of you, my father will have to love you. You've got the brains and the body. Thank God. Why did it take me so long? He smacked his head jokingly. Right here all the time. The one woman who really knows me. Elle saw Sarah glaring furiously at Warner, and for the first time thought she and Sarah might have something in common. Warner, I do know you now. I didn't know you at all before, she pronounced in a cool, even tone, lifting his hand and dropping it from her shoulder. His, his smile dropped in a confused stare. But Elle, we spent so many years together, he protested. You'll never find anyone like me again, Elle. I certainly hope not, Elle answered genuinely. By the way, your brainy fiancé looks lonely, she pointed behind him at Sarah, who was tapping her f foot in a brisk allegro. Warner wheeled around to face Sarah, his mind racing to explain what he had just declared with such indiscretion. Goodbye, Warner, Elle said as she started down the steps. She paused, turning back with a smile. I'll see you around. So, poorly written, Warner's still a pig, but one of the positives in this book that Elle doesn't end up with him. Great, we love that. Then the book ends with Elle, Brooke and Eugenia all going out to get drunk get drunk together and they make jokes about recklessly getting into debt which just isn't funny uh the very last thing of the book is sarah turning up to Elle's house and and being like look i'm like you now as she's dyed her hair to be more blonde and got a manicure at the same salon as Elle. and she says yeah i pulled an Elle woods sarah laughs i skipped class and went to the beauty salon it seemed to work okay for you she added manicured and winning in court i figured you had a secret and that's it that's where the book ends with sarah trying to be more like l skipping classes and like throwing her life away to look like l sitting with l on the same settee that her thankfully now ex-fiance cheated on her with l on oh this is awful no i hate this i hate this l is just like ha 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 you're a true blonde now and they laugh together Elle never apologises for how badly she's treated Sarah. She never apologises for sleeping with her fiancé. Elle hasn't learned anything at all about her relationships with other women. She is not a good person. This is an awful ending to the book. Terrible. I hate it. And that is it. That is Legally Blonde, the book. <sighs> One thing I did like about the book that they didn't do in the film is that they kept Elle single. I think that's great. Empowering. Loved it. Um, I think it would have been cool if they'd done that in the film but at the same time I love Emmett so much that I really don't mind he's great we need more Emmett's in this world please and um, the book also didn't touch on what actually happens to Elle in her career and her life does she finish law school does she drop out and do jewelry design we don't know it's never mentioned because apparently that's not important yeah I don't know no. one thing that they added into the film that I'm sad wasn't in the book because I think it's a really important point is they basically changed the whole ending in terms of how Elle has her empowering moment and the whole issue with Callahan in the film. So, in the book, Christopher and Elle are constantly flirting with each other, going to dinner, it's all a bit gross, um, and we never really get any conclusion of what happens to them because the ending is just so rushed. It's implied that Elle stays single, but he gives her a glowing reference and blah blah blah, but clearly the inappropriate behaviour from him, flirting with his student employee and taking her to dinner and stuff like that, it's all kind of glamorised and normalised and I don't like it, it's gross. The film handles this whole thing differently because Christopher in the book is Callahan in the film, and there's one scene where Callahan asks Elle to stay late after work, and at first it seems he's just complimenting on her, her on her work, her studies, and that sort of thing, but soon it turns creepy, and he tries to touch her leg and imply that she'll have to sleep with him to get ahead in her career. You're smart, Elle. Smarter than most of the guys on my payroll. Wow. I think it's time to discuss your career path. Have you thought about where you might be a summer associate? Oh, um, not really. I know it's very competitive. Well, you know what competition's really about, don't you? It's about ferocity, carnage, balancing human intelligence with animal diligence. Mm -hmm. Knowing exactly what you want and how far you'll go to get it. How far will Elle?
You're a beautiful girl. <sighs> so everything you just said? I'm a man who knows what he wants. She's obviously immediately disgusted, pushes him away, storms out, but sadly the first part was overseen by Sarah, who misdirects her anger towards Elle, not Callahan where it should be, and it opens up some very important discussions about misogyny and patriarchy and sexual harassment in the workplace. And I'm really glad this scene was included because it showed Callahan's behaviour as something that is seriously scummy and not okay. It was heartbreaking and awful and Elle nearly quit completely which is a sad reality for a lot of women in this situation. She literally has her car all packed up and ready to go, and Elle has a proper cry about people not taking her seriously, until she's telling all this to Paulette in the salon, and one of her old professors overhears and gives her this great pep talk and encourages her, and it's this wonderful moment of seeing all these women come together and support each other and save Elle from something horrible and throwing her life away because a man was crappy, you know? And ultimately, Elle comes out of it all stronger and more self-assured. And she goes to tell Brooke what Callahan did, Emmett finds out what Callahan did, everyone knows what Callahan did, and Brooke fires Callahan. In the book, the whole um, power dynamic is just played as, tee hee, I'll totally flirt with my boss and allow him to harass me, isn't this cute? But in the film it's actually treated as seriously as it is and it's treated as harassment, which it is. So like I say, this causes Brooke to fire Callahan, and they have Elle do this amazing walk-in as her lawyer in his place and Emmett's got her back, he's supporting her, he believes in her, it's great, it's more realistic, it's more over the top, it's more dramatic, but it's also way more empowering and impactful. Elle quit. What? Yeah, Callahan hit on her, so she quit. My God, <sighs> scumbag. Get up. What? You're fired. I have new representation. Who? also ties up all the loose ends that the book doesn't. Elle isn't just, you know, uh, lost from her sorority friends anymore. Instead, they come to the court to support her because they believe in her. And even though their lives are going in different directions, they've still got her back. They're still good friends. Her classmates come to support her. Emmett supports her. Lil Bruiser is there to support her. And Elle managed to, manages to, like, even though it's difficult and she's unprepared and she's thrown in at the deep end, um, she actually has to step up in court and be the one to say, like, okay, this is what I know about law, and also, you know what, this is what I know about hair care. And she brings it all together, and it's way more of, like, a demonstration of her using all her knowledge and everything she's learned over the film to win this case for her client. And it's a way more empowering moment, and she does it all without having to belittle other women in the process, like Book L does, you know? And then finally, obviously, in the film, after winning the trial, she turns down Warner. It's a shorter scene, it's much more concise, more powerful, love it. And then we get a nice little wrap up of um, Elle giving a speech, graduating law school. It's lovely, so much better. So, in conclusion, Legally Blonde the book is poorly written, poorly structured, and full of awful characters doing awful things, and I hate it. It's not the worst book I've ever read, it clearly had a good premise, and that was enough to inspire an absolutely iconic film, for which I'm sure myself and many others will still be grateful was made, um, but the book was ultimately a laughable but unenjoyable experience to read. Now, the film isn't perfect, absolutely not, there's a few very, very outdated moments of, you know, stereotyping or um, things like the R slur being used and stuff like that. But again, kind of product of its time, hasn't aged well. But I think as long as we can acknowledge that they're not okay and kind of take them in isolation and move them aside, the rest of the film still holds up really well and it's a lot of fun and for the time it was made, incredibly empowering and, and great. And um, like I say, I think it's interesting to see how two people can take the same premise and create such a different story with a different overall message and meaning and one can be so much more empowering than the other, you know? Oh my god, right, okay, anyway. I've been speaking a lot and I'm exhausted. Um, I'm having a really, really crappy week but I had to get these filmed because work. You know, work doesn't stop, even when you're an absolute mess. 
So, um, yeah, thank you for watching. Please let me know your thoughts. If you've read this book, let me know what you think. I feel like maybe this video wasn't as well structured as many of my videos. Um, it felt a little bit more out, of, like, all over the place when I was recording, but I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna see what I can do in editing and try and make this as good as it can be, but I, I acknowledge that it's not perfect and I'm sorry, it's not. Probably not my usual standard, but um, with everything going on, it's, it's all I can manage right now. All I got the bandwidth for. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you a lot. And um, hopefully I'll see you again soon with something a little better.